Hey, what's up, folks? Welcome to another week to live life. Rest the show. This is Hogan. That's me. Got Mike Marley on the other side, and really good show on hand today, man. Always been. Yeah, you know, you know, it's good when you're when you're talking to the guest for a while before we start recording, and then we have to say, yeah. "Whoa, let's stop here. Let's start recording." That's always a good sign. Exactly. Sometimes we have guests where sometimes we have hey, guests man, where sometimes I, I, yeah, sometimes we have guests on where. Where I'm on before you are, and we're just waiting for you to come on, and I'm trying to keep the conversation going, and I'm just yeah, going, oh, I can tell. Man, as soon as I log on, I can kind of hear, I can hear you kind of struggling a little bit. I was like, oh boy, <laughs> it's like oh, you're, you're asking them show. questions, you know, you know, like and when it's you're a long pause, <laughs> right? Kind of like when you're stuck at some party talking to someone, and you're asking them questions that you could care less what the answer is. You're just kind exactly. of stuck in that mode. <laughs> How about those cowboys, man? Yeah, yeah, the cowboys. <laughs> it's like I don't even watch football, man. <laughs> so yeah, I get it. I get it. Perfect, man. Yeah. So before we introduce him, just want to remind everyone you can support the show by using that coupon code LLA. Go over to MikeMoller.com. Get ten percent off everything you see there. Everything is fully in stock. My testosterone booster, my estrogen blocker, my Restorezyme for get those great workout recovery, recovery oil, get you some deep sleep, and red to improve that adrenal fatigue. How about with you, man? Yeah, head over to newwarriortraining.com, use that same coupon code, get 10% off everything that's over there, including the weight management course, kind of get you guys started on your program, as well as, you know, we have the wellness code book over there, and also my body weight training DVD. And currently right now, as far as three doors and both seats right now, restocking up on those. So just stay tuned. Make sure that you're on my email list so you guys know when those are back in stock. And hey, like I said, that's that's pretty much all we got for our websites, man. I'm ready to get on with this interview. <laughs> yeah, man, we have a great coach on today. He's one of our fan favorites, Christian Thibodeau's back. And it's funny, last time he was on the show, people were rapping us to get him back again. And the yeah. reason why we waited a while is because he dropped so much good information last time. I go, look, folks, it's going to take you the rest of the year to apply 10% of what he said. So go exactly. apply that stuff first and then come back. And then we'll get him back and go back into that well. Christian, how you doing today, man? Very good. Nice to be back, Mike. Do you, do you find, Christian, that you that you write a great article on stuff and then people go okay when's the when's the next article coming out or what's the next program i should get on after this and they haven't even started that they haven't even started the <laughs> oh, information yeah, oh, in the yeah, first yeah. article <laughs> no of course of course i think that people like to be seduced i mean they are seduced by a concept then they like right. they get super excited they, they can't wait for the next big thing and as right. you just mentioned they don't digest they don't apply I mean, I will take personally like a small piece of information. Like, for example, right now I'm playing with uh, like reducing my my volume because I believe that uh, the number one mistake natural trainees make is doing too much volume. So I'm getting back to a very low volume of work but going like close to muscle failure or even muscle failure. And and just studying that one element of training, Mm -hmm. I'm focusing solely on that. Just like, for example, when I am... I experimented with gymnastic rings. I spent four months doing only gymnastic ring work just so that I could understand it. So I can't understand how somebody can try something for like three days, then look for the next solution right off the bat. It doesn't work like that. You got to give your body time to uh, to gain from the methods you're applying, you're trying, you're trying to experiment with. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to get good at anything if you just yeah. keep jumping around so much. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've been right. deadlifting for years, for example, and I, I deadlift every week. I never switch to another exercise because there's I maybe mean, even after years of doing it, there's always that little t- that little tweak that makes a difference. And if if I just deadlift the next day once a month, point. yeah, yeah, that's such ahead, an please. important point. Yeah, that's it's such an important point. I believe to me, all right. Uh, I mentioned that for natural trainees, one of the biggest mistakes, if not the biggest mistake, is excessive volume. But I will say that the number one, the, the, the number two biggest mistake, and it's a very close race with the first one, is yeah. excessive exercise variation. No, I, I personally yeah. don't believe in that. I believe that people are uh, shortchanging their gains because they are switching exercises way too often. I believe that you do not start to gain maximum muscle growth until you become super technically efficient at a movement. Not only that, right. but your muscle recruitment pattern is optimized because your body hates you, right? And it also likes you, meaning that it doesn't <laughs> care if you're building muscle. It doesn't care if you're getting stronger. It just cares if you're surviving. And it will always look for the easiest way to adapt to exercise. 
And if you have room for technical improvement, if you have room for neural adaptations to become more efficient at, at an exercise, then it will prefer to improve on those elements than had muscle mass because muscle mass costs energy to maintain. So uh, if you change exercise too often, you're basically always over-relying on neural adaptation to adapt to the exercise. So you never reach uh, the fastest possible rate of muscle growth. I mean, look at, I, I, I will agree that pro bodybuilders are not necessarily the best example for good training advice, but still, I mean, sports give clues. And the fact is that for the most part, Bodybuilders use the same exercises for most of their training career. And it's the same thing with Olympic weightlifters, same thing with powerlifters. I mean, most of the, of these guys stick to the same movement day in and day out, like every single week, every single month for years on end. And they're still getting stronger and larger. In my opinion, it's the excessive variation uh, in exercise that will shortchange your gains. It, they, that gives the illusion of progress, right? Right. Because the right. first week you do an exercise, you suck at it, your, your coordination is not that good. Even if you did it before, like many months ago, your timing right. is off, your coordination pattern is not that great. The second week or the second time you do it, it's getting slightly better. Third week, it's getting better. So you're getting strength from week to week, but all the while, actual muscle size gain is very limited because most of the adaptations are neural and by the fourth week then gain starts to get slower so you change exercise because I'm, oh i'm hitting a plateau no you just the gains are about to start the gains are right. about to start and you're changing the exercises right. but i think that's a that's something that um, the problem might be due to coaches trying to sell more training programs you have to change program every four weeks otherwise you will <laughs> die that right. just to right. sell you one more program it's that whole muscle confusion thing that's uh, trendy right now, like a P90X type concept. Right? And that was mentioned in that, that article you posted on Twitter today, these, these different trends all the top coaches don't like. That one, I think, has done more of a disservice than probably yeah. anything else in there because it does give well, people that illusion that if you're not switching things out on, yeah. constantly, you're going to hit a plateau. Well, it, 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 and it, also the people don't make the difference between training and exercising. Exercising yeah. is just expending energy. I mean, you can do anything, right. and that, that's actually exercise. Training yeah. is doing a specific type of work to improve several or one physical capacity. So that has to be planned, and it has to be done over a certain period of time so you can actually measure the changes in what you're trying to accomplish. I think that most people suffer from training ADD. They just can't stick with something. They need variation. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. these people just don't like training. They just want to right. feel good about getting a sweat on. That's right. That's, that's exactly right. You know, Mark Phillippe made a good point a while back when one of his trainers asked him about Westside. And at that time, West, that Louis was proliferating a philosophy of they don't deadlift at all. They just do stuff like good mornings and they do other things. Now, now I notice that they're doing deadlifts with bands. They may not, they may not do a traditional pure deadlift, but they do a lot of deadlifting with bands and other things. So you're working on that move. But at that time, it was... It was something they rarely did. And so this guy's going on and on talking about that. And then Mark just waits for him to stop. And he says, okay, so what you're telling me is you're going to get better at deadlifting by not deadlifting. And then there was just this long pause. And yeah, the guy yeah, realized, yeah. yeah, maybe I do need the deadlift. You know? and my my yeah, experience but, has always been you don't get better at something if you're not doing it, right? Well, the thing people forget, right, is that well, there are exceptions. But most of the guys – who move to West Side or start using the West Side system. I mean, mm -hmm. I, and again, there are ex exceptions, but most of these guys are already well established, high level powerlifters. Now, That's that right. doesn't mean that the system won't work, the, it means that these people are already very efficient at the deadlift. Right. Right. So even right. if they don't practice it all that often, they know how to deadlift. They won't lose it. They might not be 100% efficient, but they are still much, much more efficient than somebody who doesn't have uh, the skill set by uh, that, that was built doing deadlift for years and years and years. Now, if you've right. been powerlifting for 15 years using a traditional system where you probably deadlifted once or twice every week, sometimes more, and you switch to a West Side system, of course, you're already good at the deadlift. So for these people, it might be true that simply doing assistance work will get the deadlift to go up because 
mechanically speaking, the deadlift is fairly simple, but you still have to master it. But once you master it, it's it, that's the lift where you fall off the groove the least. So I would right, right. agree that if you are a very good technical deadlifter and you build for the deadlift, it's probably fine not to do it that often. But that doesn't apply for 90% of the population. Yeah, and even in Westside, they're still doing similar type moves. If they're not yeah. doing a traditional deadlift, they'll do deadlift with bands, bands and where the yeah. resistance is much higher at the top. They'll do the seated deadlifts. You know, so they're doing something similar. Oh, even, move, even pin not the exact move. Right, right. Right. That's a good point, though. It's just, you just have to look at where you are in your training career. If you're someone who's just getting started, then it doesn't make sense to get distracted with all these variations when you don't even have the fundamentals down in the basic moves. But if you're someone who's way further ahead, you have a 600-pound, 700-pound deadlift, that's that's really good to the point where you've pretty much mastered the technique, and now you have to work on other things. Like in the last episode you were on, you were talking about how at some point you're not going to get better at the deadlift by just deadlifting. You have to start doing some other moves, such as yeah. – Good mornings. Now, have you found have you found that if you overdo glute ham raises, that has a deleterious effect on deadlifts? Well, to be honest, I've never overdone them, so it would be kind of hard <laughs> for me to uh, to mention that. But I, yeah, I have, so that's why I'm curious. <laughs> but, but what I, my, my theory about that, uh, and that would actually apply to any assistance exercise targeting right, right. one specific muscle is that if you do it too often with too much volume, even though they yeah. don't feel that stressful, you, that muscle never fully recovers. So right, every right, time right. you do, for example, your deadlift, you will never have the same ratio of fatigue in all the involved muscle. So you never learn to build the optimal recruitment pattern. For example, if this week your, your, your hamstrings are at 50% capacity and the rest is 90%, and yeah. then the next week the hamstrings are 90% and the rest is 90%, then the next workout hamstrings are 30%. So you never learn to optimize one recruitment pattern where every single muscle mm. is at the same level of fatigue. So that's, that's right. one of the possible drawbacks of doing too yeah. much isolation work if you want to bring up a main lift. I'm not saying that assistance work is not important. It is important. But you've got to be careful not to overly fatigue one muscle so that it completely changes uh, the recruitment pattern, the usable recruitment pattern when you're performing the main exercise. Yeah, that's that's very well said. I mean, my experience is I went crazy with glute ham raises. They just got a mach machine at the gym I go to, and I haven't done it in a while, so I was like, oh, this is cool. And then I noticed that I did deadlifts maybe a few days later, and, it, and the bar was ridiculously slow off the floor, yeah, of especially. And I just felt like I was in slow motion the entire time, and, and it was a training load that is normally not that difficult for me. And then I, I, I immediately attributed it to that. I took two weeks off from glute ham raises. And then came back to deadlifting, and there you go, it popped off the ground. Yeah, well, breaking the barbell off the floor. I mean, most people will say, and I agree, that the beginning of the deadlift is mostly quads, except for that very first inch of the range of motion. Mm -hmm. Breaking off the barbell from the floor, that's mostly hamstrings if you want to have the proper barbell path, as well right. as glutes to stabilize the hips while you're extending at the knees. So if these muscles are tired, the very beginning, the first inch of the deadlift will be much slower. And of course, if the right. beginning is slow right. in the deadlift, you're, you're screwed. Absolutely. Do you do a dip and drive and you drop your hips and rip the bar off the ground immediately? Uh, I used to do that when I competed in Olympic weightlifting. Personally, right. it fits my it fits my physiological profile. I'm naturally a lot more explosive than I am strong. So right, for right. me, it's actually a very good method. I use it when I sumo deadlift. Uh, I do mostly sumo deadlifts now. Oh, okay. uh, so I, I use that setup then. Uh, I use the, the kind of a dynamic start with the hips, a pump of the hips, then the raise. To me, it helps me because my technique is pretty good. Now, if somebody is all over the place technique-wise and doesn't have core, core, good core strength uh, and good lats activation, that technique is actually dangerous But because it, hmm. it will always be off from the start. Uh, I'm actually using that dip and drive from the hips. I'm using, I'm, when I'm raising my hips, I'm actually not just pushing my hips down. I'm using the barbell to like 
almost throw my hips down by contracting my lats, kind of like a, the, uh, the eccentric portion of a kettlebell swing. I'm activating right. my lats to pull my hips down. So I'm actually using that, dam- that dynamic start to activate, engage the lats. I, I believe that not engaging the lats is probably the main problematic issue on all the big lifts, squats, deadlifts, and bench press. So if yeah. you can't engage your lats properly at the start, uh, then you will be weak off the floor. The barbell will move forward and you will have bad leverage. So if you have good timing and you're naturally more explosive, then using that dynamic start is a big benefit. But you have, must be able to have perfect position because now you will only have a fraction of a second in the perfect setup position. If you can't get there instantly and you can't maintain core tightness, then the, bar, the barbell will move forward and you will lose your lower back arch. So it's the, yeah. it depends on where you're at, technically speaking. So Christian, why do you choose um, the sumo deadlift? Like, why are you going toward that one? I said, why do you choose uh, well, the sumo deadlift? Uh, I think it fits my leverages better. Um, Mm -hmm. At first, I started doing it simply because uh, I'm very quad dominant, and Mm -hmm. I felt that I might get more glute activation using the sumo. Actually, what I did, uh, you know, the hip circle, that big band that you attach uh, around your knees, I started doing Mm -hmm. sumo deadlift with the the hip circle around my knees to increase glute activation. It was mostly a glute exercise. But I found that my deadlift technique is much better sumo uh, than traditional. I have very short legs, a long torso, and for me, uh, the traditional deadlift, like it was all in my lower back. So when I I switch to sumo, it gives me a much better leverage. The way I do it is as soon as the bar reaches the knees, I'm really punching those hips forward, trying to get the hips under the bar instead of trying to just pull all the way back. So my range of motion is probably uh, six inches shorter in sumo than conventional. So just for lifting more weight, it's more effective for me. Uh, Since I have a long torso, it also decreases the strain on my lower back, and it allows me to work my glutes and hamstring to a greater degree because it's a weak point for me. So uh, it actually fixed or strengthened my regular deadlifts at first, but then I decided just to, to, to stick mostly with sumo deadlifts because I feel them safer. Uh, it, it, it turned out after for uh, ever since I started like lifting heavy again on deadlift, I would always seem to pull my left hamstring with conventional deadlift when I got heavy. And my technique's good, so that wasn't the problem. But ever since I switched to sumo, I can pull heavier more often and recover a lot better from that. More balance. Yeah, how tall? How tall are you? How tall are you, Chris? And you're five nine. Probably five, ten? four foot three. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know you're. I know you're eight. four. I know you're. I know you're four foot three wide. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm five foot eight with uh, with arms that are about the length of somebody who's four foot four. So I'm very <laughs> short with very long torso. If I'm seated down, I look like I'm six foot two, but I'm actually five eight. <laughs> So, yeah, we're about to play those, night, man. That's why you've been getting all those movie roles, man. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't, no, you I don't travel. Want, I don't. You, you yeah. travel a lot, right? Like you were just telling us how you were in Europe for four or five weeks. Yeah. So what do you what do you do to try to keep eating as optimal as possible, and and even training, getting your workouts in, keeping your lifestyle optimal? Well, that that's really the hardest thing, and to me, right. it really comes down to planning. Uh, I mean, I know it's not the sexy answer, but I always make sure when I make arrangement that there's a grocery store uh, within walking distance of the hotel. Because uh, to be honest, I'll make a confession, I'm the worst driver in the history of mankind. Especially in the, if I go in the UK and the, they drive on the other side of the road, I, I'm pretty sure I won't make it past the second day. So everything has to be walking distance. So it's it always first about finding a place where there's a grocery store nearby. Uh, and I will always buy my food on a daily basis. I never, uh, even at home, I'm the same way. I go to the grocery store once or twice every single day. I never I have food stored at the house. So the first thing for me is to have a grocery store at walking distance. That takes priority over the gym because mm-hmm. most hotels have gyms now. They basically suck, but it's still <laughs> better. Right. Than, I mean, 
Especially in Europe. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, that's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> in, Europe, in Europe, the dumbbells go up to about 30 pounds. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can even have dumbbells. Usually, usually it's a bunch of machines. All machines. There. Yeah, there's yeah. a machine there. Got, some, got there's lots of cardio wooden equipment. Wooden boards, wooden boards for sit-ups, you know, things like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it, it, it is really that bad. But still, yeah, is, even really. with light dumbbells, and uh, like machines, uh, just by doing body weight stuff, doing different training techniques like isometrics, uh, like slow right, eccentrics, right. like pause lifting, you can still get a decent workout with minimal equipment, uh, but right. you can't substitute good food. So right. to me, right. food takes priority over training when I'm traveling. Uh, anyway, when I give seminars, it's pretty easy to train at the gym I'm going to give the seminars at. So, right, so they right. just come pick me up and I train. Even if I only get like three good training sessions in a week and then two average sessions at the hotel gym, I I'm, I'm can maintain pretty well. Uh, but if I uh, – true story. All right, last trip, uh, I was in Belfast. Then in uh, in the UK, then afterwards in Amsterdam, and it was really my fault. And, and as you know, Mike, two weeks that's fine for traveling. Right. Third week it starts to get old, and in four weeks, I mean, you really can't stand being there anymore. Right. So on that trip, okay. the first two weeks and a half. I was super good with my diet, like eating all old food, lots of fruits and veggies, uh, lots of fish, uh, no meat, no chicken, no, no. so it was a pretty good diet. Uh, then when I got to Amsterdam, that last week, like the fourth week, uh, I allowed myself one cheat meal, like just one to celebrate uh, the end of my seminars. And after that one cheat meal, all hell broke loose, man. I mean, I couldn't maintain a proper diet for that whole week because I just didn't have the mental toughness because of the trip. And I'm telling you, the first three weeks, I, I actually progressed physique-wise. I got a bit leaner. Uh, I, I stayed the same body weight. Strength was up. I felt good. Uh, no injuries, nothing, no inflammation. And in those last five days, I'm not kidding you, I, I gained like six pounds of water weight. Like I would wake <laughs> up one day and I looked like a bloated balloon. And it, it, it really freaked me out because yeah. the, the bad thing is that after I came back from Amsterdam, I only had one day turnaround that went to St. Martin on the beach and all that stuff. So I now looked like the, the Stape of Marshmallow Man. Just because that five days, I just like didn't eat. And the fact is, my diet was was like, if you just look at the macros, it looked pretty good. I mean, my proteins were fairly high, carbohydrates were moderately low, fat was moderate, but the the, the composition of the food, I'm almost afraid to mention it, because I was eating like packaged chicken and stuff like that, full of sodium and all that crap. Yeah. Uh, frozen veggies, uh, so it was really like the quality suffered, but it had a tremendous impact on my look. No. So that, from that, I learned that you know, if I want to avoid losing muscle mass, strength, or gaining fat when I'm traveling, the first thing, the most important thing is to make sure that my diet stays 100%. If your diet stays 100% and you can manage to put some training sessions here and there, anyway, I'm walking all the time. So it's not like I'm, right, gonna, right. Uh, I'm still active and it will just do more, more good than harm by training a bit less often. But if nutrition is not taken care of, uh, then problems start to arise. So that's the most important thing. Always make sure that you have available uh, great food, easily walking distance every single day. Now, I'm guessing that you do your workouts before you teach because yeah, your yeah, yeah. audience is not there yet, right? Exactly. Rather than after yeah. where the audience is like, hey, can we hang out with you? Uh, <laughs> can we take exactly. photos? Can we videotape you? <laughs> so well, I can post it. Hey, actually, I tried with Christian Simba, though. <laughs> actually, most of the time, I don't really train on the days I give a seminar. Sometimes I will. Uh, actually, some... But... Since the seminar normally starts at 9, uh, once I, I train before, that's actually good neural activation, gets me amped up before the seminar, so, so that actually helps. Uh, right. But the, 
two other times I trained on that last trip. I mean, the two other times I, I trained during a seminar, uh, it was during the lunch break. But I tell people, you know, well, I use a very, very easy uh, excuse. I say, guys, you know, I really like you, but I'm autistic. So if, uh, which is actually true. Um, uh, so when I'm training, that's my moment. I'm recharging. So just please uh, don't come bother me when I'm training. I will stay for an hour after the seminar is done, and I will answer every individual questions, no questions asked. But right. I ask them during the lunch break, just let me do my training. And most of them actually don't stay in the gym during the lunch break, so that's not an issue. Yeah, they probably want to go eat themselves. Oh, no, exactly. They sit around yeah. and watch you work out. You know, especially especially you since when I'm traveling, it's like very short, not not that impressive workout, just to make sure that I do mostly like explosive stuff to keep my nervous system revving up and biceps curl to have a vein when I teach. That's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> you, want, you, want it you want it to match the one in your forehead, huh? I have several in my forehead. <laughs> Now, do you find that some kind of explosive move, let's say, you know, relatively light explosive move, but something explosive before something such as a heavy squat, heavy deadlift actually improves performance? Oh, yeah, no question. But again, yeah. it, 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 it always depends on the neural type of the person. Yeah. yeah. I, I find that it works best with people who are not naturally explosive. People who are naturally explosive, they don't need it. I mean, I'm talking people who don't need, like, warm-up sets before doing almost a max power clean. You have, you have those people who are what I call quick activators. Basically, in one set, their nervous system can be at 100% efficiency. Then you have the slow activator that requires many, many, many sets. I mean, it's funny because uh, one of my training partners is the exact opposite uh, as me. I mean, I'm a fast activator, uh, but I, I have very low resiliency, meaning that for me, my first set, normally my first work set is the best one. But mm. if I hit failure, for example, or grind a rep on that first set, I'm done. I mean, my performance will decrease by 10 to 20% on the subsequent set. Uh, whereas my partner, for example, let's say we're bench pressing. We will do a first set with uh, like 225. Uh, he does six reps, and it looks heavy. I mean, I'm saying like it's bare. It's almost limit. But then he will put on 25 pounds per side, and it still looks heavy. But then he'll go to three plates, and it looks easy. So if, for that person, doing an explosive move prior to a heavy lift will help because he's a slow activator. So for him, doing the explosive work will be all benefit. For somebody like me, who has a very efficient nervous system, doing the explosive work is not necessary because it will not amp up the nervous system more. But what it can do is it can drain some neurotransmitters. So it yeah. can actually decrease strength potential. So it's hard to say, well, there's a training method that will work great for everybody. I mean, there is one thing that people can learn from me. Charles Polican wrote an article about like five years ago about training depending on your Chinese sign. And people were <laughs> making fun of him. Yeah, but I remember it's, that. It's yeah. totally true. Uh, maybe the fact that he used a Chinese sign upset some people, but what he really meant was neurological profile, depending right. on which of your neurotransmitter is dominant. And yeah. depending on your neurotransmitter dominance, then some training methods will work great for you, while it won't work for other people. So it's not true to say that there's a training method out there that works great for everybody. It's all right. about finding what works for your best, for your psychological uh, profile. Same thing with yeah, diet, Charles, really. Charles, yeah, Charles brought that up last time he was on the show. He talked about how if you have someone who's acetylcholine dominant, he trains him or her a certain way, and then if someone's dopamine dominant, meaning that they're very attached to a reward, yeah. he's going to train them a certain way, while the acetylcholine people learn things quickly and they can handle volume. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because if you can, if you, if you learn quickly, then a variation or volume doesn't have the same impact on the nervous system. Yes, yeah, I'm definitely get... more dopamine. I definitely don't learn quickly at all. That's for sure. And but but I have the dopamine. I'm more dopamine driven. Where I want some kind of reward. It doesn't have to be a PR. 
But yeah. like, let's say I have a goal if I want to do this many sets for this many yeah. reps, you know, then that's what I'm focused on during the workout. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same way. That's why I don't like exercise variation. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I don't. And I don't like these workouts. I don't like these workouts where you do a, a lot of different moves. Like when I go to no. the gym, it's three or four exercises, and that's it. Yeah. So it's not going to be okay. I'm going to hit a set of squats. You know, then I'm going to do walking lunges right afterwards, and then I'm going to do front squats in the next set. And so that kind of stuff. You're telling me you're not doing CrossFit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, that was the other f interesting point that Eric Cressy brought up in that same article yeah, that he posted. Yeah, is he doesn't like high rep Olympic lifting for you yeah. know, similar reasons. Is that you're yeah. once you get fatigued, your technique goes down the drain, and that, that's yeah. why and you, you kind of have to look at the best Olympic lifters in the world never do more than three. I don't think they even do three most of the time. It's just lots of sets of one. The, the, well, no, exactly. Right. Uh, but uh, and it's funny because I've actually saw. I've actually seen some of the best, very good Olympic weightlifters try to do like I reps Olympic lifting stuff, like for a, like a YouTube CrossFit workout and all that stuff. And even these guys, like their technique turned to crap when they right, get to the right. high reps. And even even if the weight is like twenty percent of their one RM, it, 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 my opinion, it's muscle fatigue plays a role, but I believe that another element is that when you enter a state of oxygen depth, right, you are in, a, in oxygen depth, you know what that is, I mean, any athlete knows what it is. Yeah. Uh, when you reach that state, the brain, especially the motor control center of the brain, is also deprived of oxygen. So now the planning and execution of the motor patterns become less efficient. So even if the muscles still have plenty of juice to execute the movement properly, your coordination pattern is altered because the center that controls everything lacks oxygen. Mm. So that's why even if you have very good, I mean, the CrossFit lifters, I mean, I work with a lot of CrossFit athletes, and those that I work with and the, all the guys at the top have very good Olympic lifting technique. Right. And if you, they do like 90%, 95% weight, they move big weights and they are technically efficient. But even right. them, when they move to the higher rep stuff, it looks really bad. It's not because they don't know how to do it. It's not because they're not in shape. I mean, Muscle-wise, they could handle the workload. It's the fact that the nervous system is deprived of oxygen that completely fall, uh, alters the motor pattern. Right. The only person I've seen do pretty high reps with very good well, form well, is, yeah, well, is Vladimir, well, the guy he, that, he, yeah, the guy that, that Poliquin, <laughs> yeah, the guy that Poliquin was teaching a lot with. But I bet even with him, you know, because basically he was still st staying within his fitness parameters, though. It's just that he's yeah. such an exceptional athlete. I bet if you push that guy to what's difficult for him, though, it would start breaking down. No, no, of course, of course. I mean, if you look at Plokov, who snatches 200 kilos, yeah. and, and you, you put 60 kilos on the bar, then that's basically like you and me snatching with the empty barbell. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. When I got back to Olympic weightlifting, uh, one workout I did was uh, do 100 rep with the empty barbell. And I could do that, and I would maybe like do 10 reps, rest 20 seconds, do 10 reps, 10, 20 seconds, stuff like that. And there was no technique degradation because, as you mentioned, I was well within my limit. Right. But if right. you move up to at least 50%, then you have some problems. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, some trainers were asking me about my opinion on CrossFit at the gym the other day, and I mean, there's a lot of things I like about CrossFit in terms of especially how it's attracted a lot of women into weight training and it's, it's, it's helped break a lot of the myths that women previously have had about how they're not going to look feminine if they get strong. Now you see a lot more women that are inspired to be strong and look fit. They like the look of CrossFit girls. And so I, that, that, that one thing I, I definitely like for sure. I, I, I like the idea in theory of doing a lot of these different effective mediums. I just think that you have to be very careful about how you put these things together in an overall program, exactly. especially with someone who's brand new, who doesn't have technique whatsoever. I mean, there's, there's a lot. I don't, I don't, I'm not qualified to do Olympic lifting, period. I don't do any in my workouts because I've got different issues, mobility issues, especially in my elbows and so forth, which would not make it look pretty at all. You know, so kettlebell training is more of a fit for me. 
So, for example, me going to a, if I went to a CrossFit gym and they said, okay, we're going to do all these different Olympic lifting moves, that would be really detrimental for someone like me. So you can imagine someone who has really no previous workout experience or no serious previous workout experience, and then they're just thrown into this mix. That's why you see so many injuries happening there. Yeah, that's right. the biggest issue. I mean, uh, I, I give the, the, the example of my wife. Uh, my wife, um, it's funny because I was training her uh, in Colorado along with Danny Sugar. And, and uh, I was doing not a CrossFit style, but we were doing lots of cir conditioning circuits, like with battle ropes, uh, like sledgehammer striking, all that stuff. And sometimes I would include uh, Olympic lifts, like just power clean from the hang or power clean in the program. And I would have to fight with my wife for her to put more than 30 kilos on the barbell. And then she, when we get home, she decides to start CrossFit. First thing I know, she comes in and she says, well, I clean 70 kilos. I had to fight with you to put on 30. So what you mentioned is true. I mean, just because it's in a group setting, it's competitive, you see other right. people pushing you, uh, then you start to train harder. But my wife, her problem is that she has good physical qualities because she's a former gymnast, but she's not somebody who likes to train. So she doesn't master technically all these movements and all that stuff, but she has the physical capacity to do it. And so far, she hasn't been able to train for more than three weeks in a row without suffering an injury. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and you know how it is. You know, I'm not the person who can tell her, well, you need right. to train <laughs> first. I mean, that won't work, right? Nope. Uh, but, but there's, a, there's but a saying that uh, familiarity breeds contempt. So it's kind yeah, of like exactly. Kind of yeah, I call it the proximity <laughs> concept. Yeah, exactly. But I uh, you know <laughs> one of my good friends with whom I give uh, seminars with, his name is Kareem. He's a He's a CrossFit competitor who actually went to the CrossFit game. I trained him in the past, and now he's training lots of athletes himself. And in his gym, everybody who, who gets a membership has to undertake a physical evaluation, like mobility, strength ratios, and all that stuff. That's and they right. are all given uh, like a 15 minutes program that they must do before every single one. Uh, so that they can strengthen their own weaknesses and all that stuff. And the actual what they're doing never lasts longer than 12 to 18 minutes. Most of the workout is spent doing technical work on one or two lifts. So to me, that is right. a good mindset. I mean, uh, yeah. Ben Bergeron, who trains most of the top CrossFit athletes in the world, really, uh, has a very good mentality, and I think that it's somewhat similar to Charlie Francis. Uh, as far as sprinting goes, is that first you, you work on being able to have the proper quality. Like, for example, uh, Charlie Francis would start to work on maximum speed. And then as the year progressed, he worked on being able to maintain that speed over longer distances, which was contrary to the uh, the original method where you would start the year doing long distance, and as the competition got nearer, you would move on to the shorter distance, which is a big mistake because you don't spend any time building the capacity you need, speed. So Ben Bergeron and CrossFit has the same mentality. He believes that going fast, being intense, is the quality you need. So he actually does very short but super intense wads, and as the year progresses, then you would include longer and longer and longer wads. To me, right. to be good at CrossFit, it's all about intensity, so it's much better to do those very, very short wads, and then you can afford to spend more time working on technique and getting stronger and being more balanced. Yeah. Because you know, studies have shown that one bout of Tabata training has the same conditioning effect and fat loss effect as 45 minutes of cardio. Yeah. So really, a six or eight minute WOD will get you all the benefits you want as far as fat loss and conditioning. Then you can spend the rest of the workout working on fixing your weaknesses. Yeah, no doubt. Just with, with Tabata, whenever people hear what you just said about Tabata, they get really excited until they actually try doing this. And the longest, <laughs> longest, longest four minutes of your life. They'll be like, four exactly. minutes? I can do anything for four minutes. Like, no, you can't. 
Like, I mean, 20 <laughs> seconds. Because people, people never – I've seen so many Tabata articles where no one is actually doing Tabatica, the, the Tabata, the way the study was played out, right? No, they do they it exactly. for 20 seconds. They're like, they're like <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do 20 kettlebell swings and then take a minute break. Okay, no, well, that, yeah. that's something else yeah. now. Tabata is 20 seconds, all-out effort. 10 seconds, you're still working, but yeah. moderate effort. It's not even a 10-second break. It's 10-second yeah. moderate. And then 20 seconds all out, you know, for eight rotations, right? So for, for a total of four yeah. minutes. That is extremely difficult. And if you can even make it, I always tell people, I was like, yeah, it's effective. But if you can do it, you're already in great shape. Yeah, exactly. They're the, doing hardest thing doing I've, the hardest thing I've ever done myself, uh, physically speaking, I mean, mm-hmm. I was in college at the time. And we had this class on physical testing. And we had to do all the tests that we would be required to do as kinesiologists. And it was the Wingate test. The Wingate test is uh, you, ha- you do spinning with- against resistance, maximum speed for 30 seconds. The goal is to see how much power you can produce and how much of that power you can maintain for the whole 30 seconds. I mean, most people would puke after one bout of 30 seconds. Basically, Tabata, that's that eight times and that was the hardest thing i've ever done physically yeah. and if you were to have told me you have to do that eight times in a row there's no <laughs> way even if you paid me for it I, mean, I think the happy medium though is that you know people don't have to push it that hard to get good results no, you could no. do 50 percent of the difficulty of tabata a couple times a week and you're going to get great results so it's not all or nothing it's not thinking you don't want someone to do that, and they manage to survive at once, and they're like, "Oh man, I got to do that again on Wednesday, and then then, then that again on Friday." I mean, you're just totally. Well, it, it would be like saying that you have to max out on deadlift every single time you, you do a deadlift workout. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, that would get yeah, burdensome. Yeah, well, the, it, the, the, it's the, all the problem, the problem, really. Yeah, the problem is, Christian, is that that's what most people do, but that's why they never get stronger. I mean, most guys I see at the gym every time they deadlift, it's a max session. Of course, they're not moving anything impressive. Because they keep putting the themselves thing with out. The bench press, really, yeah. Oh yeah, well that's worse. I work. think that, and that's you know, you mentioned many things positive that CrossFit brought. I think that one of the negative thing is that CrossFit has the PR mentality. Right. That right. when you lift heavy, you have to go for a max. I mean, right. it's either right. you lift light for reps or you go for a max. Always. Uh, it could be a one or two RM, but it's working to a max. Uh, uh, my good friend uh, is, is, is a bodybuilding coach, and he is preparing this girl for a physique contest, and she's a former CrossFit uh, CrossFit girl. And he, t- he told me that you know he put one Olympic lift at the beginning of her workout just to amp up the nervous system. Like he told her, like just keep it fairly light, just to make sure that you get the, the nervous system amped up. Well, every single day she would work up to a max. It would take her like forty-five minutes. Then she would start her workout, with obvious, which obviously did, defeat the whole purpose. Now she had se- severe cortisol issue that prevented her from uh, losing fat at the optimal rate. But people don't understand that. They don't understand the impact of high cortisol level on body composition, and they think that just doing more and more and more work will get them better results, which is a completely false, especially if you're natural. No doubt about it. And then, I mean, nowadays, the, the, the cortisol-driven person is so self-evident that you can actually see it in their physique. You can just yeah, look yeah, at it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I, th- I think there's... You got all this muscle, but you got this distended stomach sticking all out like, whoa, dude. Just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, just hard, have, you, just like, have this, you just have this beaten down looking physique, right? Like, like, like the biosignature yeah. program that Charles does, you know, which I don't support 100%, right? But I think, I think there's a lot of stuff there that's very useful in terms yeah. of the hormonal connection on how you store body fat. And you can, especially with estrogen dominance, man, like every day if I walk around, I'm going to see at least 10 guys that are visibly estrogen dominant. I mean, and this is with clothes on, you know? So, I mean, they're they're so estrogen, uh, they hold body fat like a fat woman. You know, they're all in the hips, legs, big fat stomach. They got the estrogen dominant breasts. It's pretty scary. What's really scary to me is not even how prolific it is, but how comfortable guys are looking like that. It, It really is frightening to me. When you look like well, when an overweight guy looks like an overweight when an overweight guy looks like an overweight woman, that's pretty frightening. Well, well, when you look at the average society and you see that everybody looks like you, it's kind of comforting. So, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But no, it is uh, many, many good things 
uh, with the bioprint method. Um, uh, I think that it, it is, I mean, I've, I've looked at the research and it's obvious that cortisol level is totally linked with intravisceral fat storage, which is the most dangerous fat. Uh, estrogen right, right. increases fat storage in the limbs, not just the, not just the legs. That, that's one misconception. I mean, studies have shown that high estrogen leads to peripheral fat storage, which means the huh. arms and the legs. Uh, both, whereas uh, a low testosterone or low growth hormone or high cortisol, any of the three or insulin resistance will lead uh, to central fat storage. So uh, I would not say that it's as precise as saying you will store in the suprailiac if it's insulin, for example. Uh, but there is definitely something to several hormones uh, leading to more central fat storage and other more peripheral fat storage. I see. Okay, that's very interesting. So I mean, I mean the, the first, are, are first you, are thing you, I notice personally when I, uh, if I do too much, I'm normally a very vascular person. Uh -huh. uh, the first thing I notice when I start to overtrain, uh, do too much volume, which people don't understand that the main reason, uh, I mean, of course, stressful situation in your life will increase cortisol release. But as far as training goes, the number one cause for elevated cortisol is excessive training volume. Because yeah. during training, the role of cortisol is to mobilize stored energy. So the more volume you do, the more glycogen you need in your workout, the more cortisol you will release. Uh, so to me, when I, I overdo it on the volume side, the first thing I notice is that I lose vascularity on my arms. I, I become bloated in my arms, uh, even in my legs. I lose vascularity there. So to me, that is the first sign of overtraining, that I'm starting to retain water. And the next step, if I continue, is I will start to store fat in those areas. Do you find that with cortisol, you actually, you know, you want to go into a workout with an elevated cortisol, and then you want to mitigate that after the workout to induce recovery? That, that's not my mindset. Uh, no. I know that it is a very popular mindset. I mean, Charles no. uh, is promoting that. You know, I, I have nothing but deeply, deep, uh, deep respect for him. He's my first mentor. We're still good friends. Uh, but yeah. on some areas, we don't agree. I personally believe that cortisol, you should do everything possible to keep it as low as possible. Hmm. That's okay. why I personally like to have carbs and amino acids pre-workout instead of post-workout. Uh, because if you have glucose in your bloodstream while you are training, uh, then you don't need to mobilize as, more, uh, as much of your glycogen stored. So that means that you will not release cortisol as much. Uh, if you are of the mindset that uh, you do not consume carbs or amino acids pre-workout, then yeah, I guess you would want to have cortisol elevated before the session because that will facilitate uh, the mobilization of stored energy, which will fuel your workout. But I personally prefer to give energy that is readily available during the workout instead of forcing my body to, uh, to, to mobilize what is in store. Because in my opinion, the, when cortisol, when cortisol will go up during the workout and you should totally do everything in your power to decrease it after the session. But you should still, in my opinion, try to minimize its release during a session. So that right. you have a cortisol to bring it. Yeah, Pardon? cortisol is going up because you're not giving yourself the fuel. Oh, exactly. To, exactly. So in other words, so instead of not giving yourself the fuels, give yourself the fuel so that you don't have, yeah. you don't re you don't re rely on the cortisol response. Exactly. Following that line of thought, would you avoid stimulants pre workout as well? Like a lot of the pre workout. Well, I personally avoid stimulants all, all the time. Okay. Uh, okay. I believe that core, that's well. And then I, I'm, stimulants, that, that's one of my big pet peeves. I mean, I'm obviously, personally, I'm against stimulants, except for some rare occasion, like if you're going for a world record or something. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. I, I explain my opinion, right? And of course, many people will disagree, and that's fine. Uh, the first problem is that the stimulants will mask fatigue. In, in a way, they're kind of like painkillers. I mean, let's say you right, have an injury. Right. You take painkillers, they mask the pain, so you might do exercises right. you have no business doing. Well, if right. I'm taking stimulants when I'm feeling tired, in 15 minutes I'm amped up and I can do my workout. But if you're tired prior to a workout, it might very well be that your programming sucks. 
You maybe have yeah. you, you have too yeah. much volume. Maybe you're not recovering properly. Maybe your diet is not good. Maybe your lifestyle is not good. So taking those stimulants will, will mask the negative effect and might actually prevent you from making the changes you need to be making in your your habits. The second problem is that stimulants mostly work by increasing your production of adrenaline. You're basically right. having your adrenals overproduce. That's exactly yeah. like if I have a business and I'm asking all my employees to work double shifts. At first, yeah. my yeah. production goes up a lot, but eventually those employees won't be able to follow, follow suit. They will burn out. And now they can't even make a single shift. They can't even come in yeah. to work. Now I'm screwed. Yeah. Same thing. If I overstimulate forcing the adrenals to overproduce adrenaline and noradrenaline, then I can suffer adrenal burnout. And now I can't produce that at all. Now, what is the main purpose of adrenaline and noradrenaline? It is to get the body ready to perform, which includes mobilizing energy. So if my adrenals are down, what do I do? I pump out more cortisol. If I pump out more cortisol, then I, I'm more catabolic. And also studies have shown that cortisol itself can increase the expression of the myostatin gene. Now, the more you exp- express myostatin, the less muscle you can build. So having yeah. cortisol that is too high will completely kill your muscle growth. It will inhibit mTOR activation. It will decrease protein synthesis. It increases protein breakdown, and it increases myostatin expression. So that's the second thing. Then, as you know, cortisol and testosterone are fabricated from the same mother hormone, pregnenolone. So if I have to overproduce cortisol, then I have less raw material to produce testosterone. So in the long run, over-abusing stimulants will lead to low testosterone levels and high cortisol levels, which is probably the worst mix. You tend to cause the cortisol steal to happen. I remember there was a friend of mine who was a soldier. She came back and we did some... She she had depression and things like that. So we just wanted to look at her hormonal profile. And if you looked at her cortisol curve, that looked great, right? Page one, you're like, okay, this is a pretty good cortisol curve. Mm -hmm. Then you look at page two and you notice that she has no pregnenolone, no progesterone. She's completely cannibalizing the top of the sex hormone chain in a desperate attempt to keep cortisol, to keep the cortisol curve optimal. So yeah, I can, I can definitely see how that would be a problem with a lot of people. I, I think what you, I mean, you brought up a lot of good points, but I think the one point that a lot of people should really pay attention to is the fact that, you know, why are you fatigued every day? Why are you tired all the time? And oh, exactly. why do you need a pre-workout kick to get your workout going, right? Shouldn't you have energy from a good night's sleep, from optimal nutrition? So why do you need a pre-workout drink that had, that just is going to put you in this stimulated state? And then like you, one thing that's also going to happen is that, is that if you're tired and then you take, a stimulant to give you artificial energy, as I call it, you're going to be even more tired after that workout than you would have been if you didn't take it. So now there's like a double whammy effect. It's like, it's like going into credit card debt, right? Like you're buying a bunch of stuff you can't afford and then payback's a bitch. Now you got to pay it back and there's interest (laughs) and it just keeps firing out of control. You know, it's like that kind of thing. So it's like, you know, you're making a deal with the double. You're basically saying, I'm going to, I'm going to take this now. So I have more energy right now. But Mm -hmm. tomorrow I'm going to have a lot less energy than I would have uh, or even later tonight. That's such a good point because my my opinion is that the more good workouts you can have, the more you progress. Now, if abusing stimulants give you one good workout but two really bad ones, you had a loss. I mean, and it's it's funny right. because it reminded me of when I was 18 years old, I was working at the Canadian equivalent of Home Hardware. How yeah. Home Depot. I was I was loading uh-huh. uh, concrete plates all summer long, and since I was strong, they would put, put me alone so that they would could save some money. <laughs> and oftentimes I would do double shifts. So I started taking uh, the the old Rip Fuel formula. I don't know if you remember that, which was yeah, very yeah, very strong it. stimulant. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I was always, I was taking that, and then I, I was doing a double shift, twelve hours. The first six hours, I mean, I'm I'm singing, I'm almost dancing when I'm carrying those like <laughs> big plates. And then the second hours, I'm I'm like taking one step was an effort. I actually cried during my shift, if you would believe that. So I know what it is. I'm about to pay pay that debt back. But, uh, well, I'll yeah, give you another don't... story, man. Uh, yeah. Early in my career, you know, I was trying to get things going. I had a lot of personal life stress, financial 
too. I was living in Santa Monica. I was barely rent each month. You know, I was married to a real bitch at that time. So that was, you know, anyone who will tell you personal life stress is like having a cortisol transfusion 24 seven, you know, it's impossible to relax when you have, right. it's like, just, it's just, it's just like having coffee being inundated with cortisol. So anyway, on top of all of this, I'm trying to get my workouts in still, if anything, I was working out more than I normally do as an, as an escape from all of it. And then on top of that, I was taking ephedrine and other stimulants and so forth. For a while, you felt like, you know what, I'm on top of all of this. I'm only sleeping five hours a night. I got all this stress. I'm still getting these workouts in. Well, long story short, that culminated in a severe case of pneumonia, so huh. severe that I nearly died from it. Both of my lungs got completely filled up with bacteria. Wow. You know, they, they drained 40 liters of this stuff out of my lungs. The next day, they, they pulled out another 20 or 30. You know, so this is this is where that, that whole saying, stress kills, you know, I understand that on a personal level because yeah. really almost from all of this. So it can be really dramatic. No, it can. And those extreme experiences really teaches you the impact of the various stress hormones on your body because most people are not aware. Uh, they, they, they don't feel it, so they don't believe it exists. People will make right. fun of hormonal manipulation. Uh, so that's, that's like a snake oil salesman kind of stuff. But really, right, 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 right. Uh, until you've experienced the, the, the negative effect, then, then you know it's real. But you don't have... Well, the, well, the real problem is, is that most people f are so used to feeling like crap exactly. that they think that's normal. That's the other thing. Correct. They don't even know what optimal... I mean, I mean when, when was the last average person optimal, if ever, in their life? Yeah. Most you know, people they, they, don't, they don't even know what optimal percent. means. Yeah. yeah, most people wake up, they're tired. It doesn't matter how much they slept. But, but it's, yeah, as they it's their normal state, so they don't question whether it's right. normal or not. That's right. And everyone they know is in the same boat. So yeah. it's, they're just thinking, okay, this is the way it is. This is what life is like. Yeah, and then exactly. you start feeling optimal. You're like, whoa, this is a totally different experience. <laughs> <laughs> or you start, totally. if they know someone that's feeling optimal, they think that's weird. Like, why are you so happy all the time? You no, know? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> <laughs> <in the drugs. laughs> yeah, they, exactly. They think you're high or something. Like, dude, are you okay? Like, no, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> So with, with following this line of thinking with mitigating or controlling cortisol or keeping cortisol optimal, do you avoid long stretches in between meals? Are you a frequent eater? No, I'm, not, I'm really not a frequent eater. Uh, okay. Uh, you, again, in, in, intermittent fasting or what, what do you do there? Is I, it, is it more consensual? Now, I, I've done intermittent fasting for long periods of time. And it works, it suits, my, and that goes back to what I was saying earlier. I mean, what's optimal it, is what suits your psychological profile. Personally, right, right. when it comes to food, my psychological profile is more like of a binge eater than a nibbler. Uh, I prefer to feel satisfied after a meal. If I don't feel satisfied after a meal, I just go crazy. It, it's like if my, it's exactly like <laughs> if my wife did begin to tease me and then run away when I'm ready to go. And she does that six <laughs> times a day. Personally, that happens I, often. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> after, after nine years of marriage, it doesn't happen anymore. But, <laughs> well, I, not, I noticed that you said that you don't want to travel too much because you'll miss your dogs, and that's all you exactly. said. Exactly. <laughs> well, I have to feel it, man, when you have one wife, so there's three times the love, right? <laughs> but I, th I think, but yeah, I think I, your, marriage I, I, works so, your marriage works so well for all the dating you do overseas. Now it's all coming together here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, well, what happens overseas, right? But, uh, well, no, I mean, for, it's, um, the, it's the 5,000-mile the five, the 5, rule. Can we get back to the question? <laughs> 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 I won't interrupt you. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, my person, I've done intermittent fasting for a fairly long period. It doesn't work that well now for me because I train at 6 a.m. in the morning. So it's, Ooh, okay. it's doable. I've done it and it works. But oftentimes yeah. I will do intermittent fasting for maybe one or two days a week. Uh, right. But most mm -hmm. of the time I will eat probably two or three meals a day. That's normally my, my, okay. my thing. But I will eat okay. uh, broccoli. I would eat spinach. I will eat uh, bell peppers throughout the day. So it's not okay. really like no food content in my stomach. Uh, it's, it's funny because um, the, the time I felt, that, you know, I'm, I'm, I used to be really bad with diet. I mean, I used to never yeah. answer diet questions because I, I didn't feel 
the right to give people any advice on nutrition because my diet was basically Fruit Loops, fast food, uh, and donuts. Uh, I obviously, I uh, <laughs> didn't advertise that, but that, that was what the way it is. Uh, but I, did, I have some, I have um I had some some health issues that forced me to uh, change my diet, and a good friend of mine he, he put me on uh, this. Uh, just uh, all veggies cure for a week, and I've never felt better in my life. Uh, so mm. that's why I started to eat basically uh, like 90% like a vegetarian, but with uh, with fish in there for protein, uh, but only okay. white fish, yeah. personally. Uh, yeah. And that you still, is you, working, you, is working you take way. You take whey protein or anything like that? or uh, Sometimes, but more for convenience. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're not, you're not a protein uh, shake guy per se. No, really. I used to be when yeah. I when I was working personal training for 60 hours a week. Right. I would basically live on right. shake. But what I found yeah. is that it gave me uh, water retention, bloating. Mm. Uh, also, it it was really hard to lose fat around the belly. I really believe oh. that the way protein is actually insulinogenic. So it can mm. have not as bad as sugar, but if you do too much of it, uh, it can have some pretty bad symptoms as far as uh, fat, fat gain and stuff. Like that. <laughs> making fat does much harder. Uh, so I use it only for convenience purposes. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I went to Europe, uh, I, I bought, I brought with me a tub of one pound of whey protein, and it, it was completely used up only after the fourth week. So that may be like one scoop every three days or something like that. Right, right. So I'm, not, I'm not a huge you protein do, powder guy. You use anyway, any think, kind of supplements in people, between? Uh, I, I use a lot like of cr- curcumin. Branch chain amino, something like that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I, use, I use a pre-workout formula. Uh, okay. Right now I'm using plasma pre-workout. Uh, as far as other supplements are concerned, I, I'm a big believer in curcumin, uh, omega-3 and omega-7 fatty acids. Uh, mm-hmm. These are uh, the ones I use the most, also a green tea supplements. So that's pretty much, and um, magnesium supplements, that's pretty much what I use as far as okay. uh, the, the, my, my staples. I will throw in other supplements here and there depending on specific goals. Uh, like if I want to uh, increase testosterone, reduce cortisol depending based on uh, if I have a very stressful situation, stuff like that. But these yeah. are my staples, yeah. With with macronutrients, is there is there any breakdown you shoot for in- Terms of no, terms I'm, of I'm really not. If, I, if I'm shooting for a photo shoot, for example, I had a photo yeah. shoot a few yeah. months back, then I will be more controlled as far as caloric intake and stuff like that. But most of the time, I, I'm just focusing on eating quality food. I'm basically eating as much green veggies as I can. Uh, that's my mm-hmm. first staple. Then I'm trying to get uh, at least two different colors of veggies in my day on top of the green veggies. And then I have my fish. Sometimes chicken if I want to change, and basically that that's pretty much my diet. And some some things, some, sometimes some almonds. Uh, that's pretty much my diet. The quantity will just vary on depending on how hungry I am. Sometimes I will have rice in there if I if I want to gain some muscle mass, for example. I, be, I really believe that protein is overdone for muscle mass, and carbs are are underdone for muscle mass. I think yeah. that yeah. Uh, yeah. carbs are actually more important for, and that's coming from a guy who used to be a super low carbs advocate. Uh, I really believe yeah. that carbs are the one of the key to muscle growth, especially when timed properly. Uh, most people yeah. are limiting their muscle mass gains by not eating enough carbs in their diet. So. Yeah. Well, why, do you, why do you think there's such a carb phobia right now? Well, I, I think that uh, I'm a good example of what goes on in people's mind. Because keep in mind that uh, when I was younger, I was that fat kid. Uh, actually, I wasn't a fat kid. I got fat when I was 18. And that was really because I was following every workout with five hamburgers and fries, and I was training twice a day. And then I would I would take a Get Big Drink, which was a, a formula by John McCollum from the 1970s, which was a big bulking era. I would take like two servings of weight gainer, uh, some ice yeah, cream, peanut butter, like 10,000 <laughs> calories or something, and I had to drink yeah, it yeah. throughout the day. It's crazy <laughs> stuff. Uh, but I, I, I gained like 40 pounds of fat 
during that right. time. So it was. But uh, what happened is that uh, for me, a low carbs diet is the only diet that led to rapid loss in weight at first. But the main reason is that I didn't know how to manipulate carbs, and back then I was a carb addict. So to me, if I ate, let's say for example. Um, one potato, then I would go binge out on two bags of chips and something like that. If I opened the floodgates, then I would, I would go crazy. I think that people who are insulin resistant, if they start to eat just a little bit of carbs, they start craving carbs like crazy. I don't know right, if it's a neurological right. thing or a hormonal thing, but it, it, it happens. Uh, yeah. So I think that's why for these people, the low carbs diet work great. It's because it gradually, res- it, they don't get those cravings. Uh, and also they can gradually reprogram their insulin sensitivity. But once you're yeah. fairly lean, I think you cannot have optimal body composition changes on a low carbs diet. It's definitely hard to have optimal performance. Well, and just, just not just that, but you look at carbs. All right, just let's look around. Uh, let's look at the the, the workout window. Uh, as I mm-hmm. mentioned earlier, if you have carbs pre-workout, uh, then you have glucose re- readily available, so you don't have to mobilize as much stored glycogen, which means that cortisol doesn't go up as much. If cortisol doesn't go up as much, your potential for muscle growth higher. Then you have the fact that insulin itself will activate mTOR or amplify the mTOR response to training. And mTOR is the light switch and protein synthesis is the light. So if I turn on mTOR more, then I will get more muscle growth. So having the carbs around the workout will amplify the anabolic response. So right off the bat, if I don't have carbs around my workout, I will have suboptimal increase in uh, performance, as you mentioned, but also gains. Uh, then there's also yeah. studies showing that on a low carbs diet, the IGF-1 uh, is is lowered, and IGF-1 is in large part responsible for maximum pro- uh, protein synthesis or hypertrophy. So if you have, if you don't have carbs around your workout, your training response is lower. And if you are too low in carbs for the rest of the day, then your IGF-1 levels never reach optimal levels to maximize muscle growth. So that is for muscle growth. Of course, for body fat, it might be a bit different story. You don't, don't need as much carbs. But I still believe that if somebody is trying to lose fat, you should keep the carbs around the workout because, let's face it, when you are on a caloric deficit, right, cortisol will be elevated throughout the day because you have to mobilize stored energy, right? If I'm on a deficit, I need to rely on my reserves. So automatically, that leads to a greater uh, level of cortisol. So the last thing I want is to spike cortisol even more during my workout, especially lifting workout. The goal of a lifting workout should never be to increase fat loss. The role of a lifting workout is to preserve or gain muscle mass while you're training to lose your body fat. So you want to make that window as anabolic as possible, and surely you want to avoid increasing cortisol output even more. Yeah, that's definitely a lot for people to take hold of because so many people buy into the yeah. you know, reducing carbohydrates to near zero, going on but ketogenic it's, it's, diets for a long time. People Even people like to be seduced instead of be convinced. They are mm-hmm. easily seduced no by a concept. Absolutely. Now, uh, 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 like a broad concept will sell. A science-based right. approach will not sell. Uh, right. and, and also face it, cutting carbs completely is easy. Well, it's not easy, but it's simple. I mean, you don't have to overthink, yeah. just don't eat carbs. But now if you right. have to eat right. carbs at only specific amounts at specific times, most people don't want to do that. I'll give an example as far as supplements go. I mean, uh, Charles, uh, now it's BioPrint, but before it was BioSignature. Now, when it was right, BioSignature, right. people had these protocols. They had to take maybe 10, 20 pills, sometimes more during the day. Uh, even if it worked, the fact is that the average person doesn't want to do that or doesn't have the discipline to do it. They want something right. they don't have to think about. Because yeah, uh, the average right. person, if they have to think about food, 
then they will start to get craving. If they don't have to think about it, it's an afterthought, they don't get the same cravings. If they have to, okay, now I have to eat in two hours, it has to be that and that. Your mind is on food, and you are at a much greater risk of starting to get cravings. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. When, you're, when your whole day revolves around when you're going to be eating, now you're thinking yeah. about eating all the time, and as a result, exactly. you're going to be hungry all the time. So that makes a lot of okay. sense. <laughs> and that's the problem really with any diet. It's the problem with really any diet, isn't it? I mean, it's an over-focus on what you're going to be eating or not eating, but it's, it's a focus on it. Now that's constantly going through your mind. And that's what attracted me to uh, intermittent fasting in the first place, is that it freed my mind up completely. Uh, yeah. so, so to, to I think me, that's the big appeal to that. And, yeah. Pardon? No, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just mentioning that even today, I will still do intermittent fasting once or twice a week, uh, especially when I have a busy day planned, and right. I don't suffer any drawbacks from it. I mean, some people might when they have fast metabolism or if they have elevated cortisol. I mean, that, that's the one thing. I mean, I was discussing that yeah. with my, yeah. a good friend of mine who is a nutritionist, and uh, intermittent fasting, any diet can work, but it won't work for everybody. Somebody right. who has elevated baseline cortisol levels should not go on intermittent fasting because during the fasting period, cortisol will go up a lot. Whereas right, some people, right. those people who have cortisol under control, they don't have a problem there, intermittent fasting would be a great way to eat. So it really is a matter of hormonal profile as well as psychological profile. I think for some people, they don't have a healthy mental state to do it no. because it leads to maybe previously poor eating behavior such as binging and so forth. They're like, oh, I did, I did this when I was a teenager. Yeah, exactly. And I'm going to go the whole day with, I'm going to go the whole day without <laughs> eating. It's like, okay, you're going to go the whole day without eating, but when you do eat, you have to make healthy choices, not just eat anything. Exactly. They, they use that one yeah. because otherwise, everybody, every American would be super lean, right? Because that's what they do. They, they don't <laughs> eat breakfast. Right. They rarely that's eat right. lunch Everyone's and then they, they just like eat anything they want in the evening. Right, exactly. and then they exactly. start going into the whole flex. Then they start going to flexible dieting. It's like, well, as long as I'm meeting a certain amount of calories while I'm, you know, intermittent <laughs> fasting, you know, as long as I'm getting, you know, two twenty five hundred calories, no matter where it's coming from, that's all that matters. And they start spouting that's out. That's the most, that's the stupidest approach I've ever <laughs> yeah, heard. Absolutely, uh, exactly. absolutely. You know, but, but, in, but it's world world world. like you said, Christian, it's very seductive. So yeah. when people hear that, they're like, yeah, wait a minute. So I don't have to think about eating they all day long. Exactly. So I can also also just looking at. I, I think looking at calories is a big mistake too, right? So you're saying, yeah. okay, I, I'm not going to eat more than 2,500 calories, so it doesn't matter where those calories come from. Where in reality, if 3,000 calories of really healthy food is going to do a lot more for your hormonal profile than yeah. 2,000 calories of unhealthy food, even I though one's a calorie deficit. Boy for uh, if it fits your macros. I mean, I was that mm -hmm. guy, and I <laughs> felt like crap. Now, I really felt like crap, yeah. and I was. On some days, I would retain 10 pounds of water. Other days, I would look great, but I would never know when that would happen. And, I, and I've, I've been on both sides of the fence, and I know for a fact that there's a huge difference. In my opinion, in my opinion, yeah. the three most important things that the diet must do. First, it must make you sensitive to insulin. Second, it must reduce inflammation. Third, it must put the body in an alkaline state. These are the three most important things for a diet. Now, it doesn't matter what you do to get there. Some people will need to eat a certain way. Other people will have to eat another way. But if you can accomplish these three things, you will be healthy and you will get maximum optimal body composition changes. But when you think about it, making your body grow is a lot like trying to make some crops grow. You can have the best grains, you can have the best weather, you can have the best fertilizer. If the soil is rotten, nothing will grow. It's the same thing with the body. You can have the best supplements, the best training program. If the body is not healthy, then it will never grow or lose fat optimally. Yeah, I just thought that you had Yeah, that's that another area. You know that's, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was saying, ahead, I saw Chris say, post that on Twitter. I was like, yeah, man, that, that's, that's spot on, right? And I think I actually retweeted that, too, when I saw you post that. So. No, that's a really good point. So I think that's another area where people get seduced and distracted is over-supplementation. And I'm a big fan of supplementation, yeah. but you have to remember, supplement, what a supplement 
it means. It's a supplement to doing everything else right. So optimal training. I mean, supplements are not going to make make up for poor training, poor quality of sleep, and certainly not poor nutrition. So it's, it's kind of like you do every you do everything else right. And on top of that, I look at supplements even further down the category. So I may have optimal nutrition, optimal sleep, optimal training, and then optimal restoration. I get a massage once a week. I get chiropractic adjustments regularly. You know, I do a lot for restoration. Yeah. And then no, like and the I next year, when you look at the old Soviet athletes, they actually were periodizing the restoration methods. They were not just periodizing right, the right. training. They also periodized the restoration methods because just like with training, the body can get used to certain restoration methods. So if you use always the same thing at the same frequency, eventually it doesn't have a positive impact or not the same positive impact on the body. Right. Uh, I see. Is there is there any restoration protocol that you utilize, something that is part of your routine? Well, the one thing I often do is that I really like uh, – I don't like aggressive restoration methods. Uh, and I yeah. used to take like, like a cryosana or something like that. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, I used to do that, but I find that to be a bit aggressive. Now I keep that yeah. for periods where I have a very high level of stress. The best example is if I'm doing a photo shoot in six to eight weeks, my diet is a lot more severe, uh, I'm training a lot more, I need all the help I can get, then I will use those advanced methods. But for in, in the normal situation, the method I like the most, I have a, a hot tub in my backyard, I like to just soak for 40 minutes in there. I mean, it's not excessive, it just increases blood flow. So, so it right. relaxes the muscle. I like Epsom salts bath uh, to help uh, decrease inflammation, relax the muscles. Uh, so these, to me, are non-aggressive restoration methods. Uh, these can be done on a weekly basis, and it's sometimes part of my daily routine, like the, the hot tub, for example. It helps me relax. And another one that is really, I mean, we're talking about seductive training methods or diet, that that. That one, the one I'm going to talk about, is really not seductive. But to me, the best restoration method is walking my dogs. I mean, that doesn't yeah, sound like much, but just, just walking in itself, to me, it gives Absolutely. me time to think, and it really helps me re yeah. uh, recover. I think that that is something that people don't take the time to take walks. I mean, slow walks. Just take time to reflect. Uh, almost meditate while moving. I think that is probably better than just static meditation. It, to me, yeah. it just puts everything in place. It re-energizes me, and it really helps with my capacity to recover. Increases the blood flow, yeah. but not at a, a level of activity that increases cortisol level. Remember that if you don't have to mobilize glycogen, then you will probably not increase cortisol output. So just walking will not interfere with your capacity to train. Actually, it will improve it. So these are... Yeah, you're, not gonna over, you're not going to overtrain. No. Yeah, you're not going to overtrain <laughs> no. walking. I, I do five-mile walks every day with my dogs, yeah. so I'm going to talk to you. In fact, I like to do it sometimes late at night for the reasons you just mentioned. It's meditation. Yeah, you get all your thoughts yeah. out. So you sleep a lot better. Nobody's around. Stop night. Exactly. Trying to talk to you while you're doing it. You know, that's why I like doing it late at night. Well, no, no, one's trying to talk to, no one's trying to talk to me anyway. I'm a mean-looking dude. I'm the same. I'm not mean looking. I just look antisocial. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There yeah. you go. There it is, right there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's. Uh, I, I like what you said also in that you're not trying to make it a workout. You say this is time. No, you're not trying to walk as fast I mean, as possible. You don't have a heart rate variability monitor on. You know, you're just you're just getting out there and <laughs> right. And, 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 let your you body and, and, yeah. and that, that's you know, the, the article you mentioned. The, the, the earlier about uh, the, the, the ten coaches, I mentioned the biggest problem, the biggest trends that were problematic yeah. in our industry, and, and Scott Abel gave a very good one. People try to quantify everything. And, right, right. You know, I've, I've never held a training journal in my life, never held a, a nutrition journal in my life, I mean, I think that, to me, that, that's like if you had training with a journal and uh, timing my rest periods and calculating the tonnage I'm doing, it's like I'm training at a dentist. It puts everything right. in a box. Right. It, it becomes artificial. I think that one of the biggest gifts you can give to somebody is show them how to interpret uh, what the body is feeling during a session. Because once you understand yeah. that, you will be your own best coach and you will never make mistakes that will put you in trouble again. 
I think that's a good point, though, especially the last one. You you have to get to the point where you are your own best coach, and constantly relying on experts to give you advice. Like I've known people who've worked out for 10 years and they just keep jumping from one expert to the next. And it's like, look, don't you know how to train yourself by now after 10 years? <laughs> right. I mean, you should. <laughs> to, me, uh, to me, a coach, right? A person, I, I've never described myself as a coach. And to be honest, all right, if you asked me to write you a training program, it would not be any better than the programs I write on T Nation or the program you would see by another coach. Right, right. I see myself right. as a problem solver. I mean, yeah. and the, the, my, my best work is if you come to me with one specific problem. Chris, I've tried everything. My squat will not, just not go up because of that problem. How can I fix that? I will find a solution. That's what I'm good at. And I think that that's why I prefer to work with people who have more experience. Not because I can't train beginners. It's because I feel that I'm most useful helping people like, fix their problem. But I, I prefer to work with people who get 95% of everything right, and they just need help with that extra 5%. But the thing is, yeah, I think that most coaches... I, I, I agree. Most coaches, I think, try to make themselves be more important than they really are. Well, that they, goes back they, to the Instagram, the Instagram coach example that you brought yeah. up in that article. It's, yeah. it's perfect for that, where you have this huge Instagram following, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, I bet I can start charging these people for stuff. And then it falls exactly. into, even though you're not remotely qualified to do it, but somehow you feel that you are because of all the attention and likes that you're getting. Oh, how do you work your man? Oh, you know, Exactly. Well, you know, with, with, basically, you're, you're, you can pay to share your experience. Basically, he's like, okay, this is what worked for me, and I know this. Yeah. Uh, you can pay me to make it work for you, but I'm like, you don't. He doesn't even know your problem. You no, know, exactly. Like, and he, but even if he knew it, he probably doesn't know how to fix it. You know exactly. how to fix the problem, right. the right. problems he that's had right. personally. But that's right. why online coaching can only work if the coach has worked with hundreds of people already, and I've seen it all. But how many exactly. online? Coaches? Yeah, that's right. The, the thing is, the, the way social media works, and you probably know that better than I do, is that one to five percent of the people that follow you will buy something from you. So, of course, if you have a million followers on Instagram and you start to market yourself, you will get some sales. And people might right. only buy one program because they realize it's crap, but you still right. have right. ten thousand people buying something from you. Exactly. So that's that's, that's right. more enough to make a good living because anyway, in two months, in three months. You'll have, have some followers. brand new followers that will buy something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, you know, it's a bad sign when someone has a new ebook every three months. <laughs> and I've been, and I wrote three books, but the last one was written like in like five or maybe like more than that, like almost ten years ago. And I've been trying to write another book for uh, the past <laughs> five or six years. And I've started maybe ten of them. But I, I, yeah. have, I have not completed a single project. I have one coming up with Paul Carter, but that's like the one book in 10 years. So I, I can't understand how somebody can like. Well, I mean, there's, there's like, only so much. So there's only training. so much you can say. You know, so. Well, there's only yeah. so much you can say without just being repetitive and redundant. Oh, exactly. Most of the time, people are repetitive. They come out with one training video, right? The, the video is a huge success, and mm -hmm. so now there's pressure to come out with more, but they don't really have anything right. else to say. So if they're, if they're honest, they're going to say, you know what? I put everything I have into that last video, and until I learn some new exactly. stuff, I don't really have anything to say. Maybe five, six years from now or never, And they, but, but, the, but, but they want to make money. They realize, okay, I can make this much money if I just throw something else out. So they come out with a, a sequel, which is essentially just a repackaged version of the first video. <laughs> right. You know, when I, I did my it. last kettlebell video, I did my last kettlebell video in, in in terms of a series. It was like a fat loss solution, the kettlebell solution for fat loss, mental toughness. You know, after I did that video, I was like, I don't have anything else to say other than I want to put out a, a beginner video just to cover that category and so forth. But that and that was a big hit. So there's there certainly was pressure to monetize that by going forward with something else. But I, in, in my head, I was like, I don't have anything else to say. Certainly not for a, another video. And then I just moved on from that. So, I mean, it's, there's, there, there's, sometimes when you come out with, with your first, whatever it is, your first book, your first video, you give it everything you have. Oh, actually, it's, it's everything that you've learned up to that point, which could be tremendous. You could have been researching for 10, 15 years, and then all of that is going into that first project. But for the second project, you know, we're talking maybe nothing. Everything you had is in that first project, and so now there's only a couple of months going into the second project, if even that. 
Yeah. Then you just start making up stuff. Then you start you start getting cle- you start getting clever. And clever is never good, man. Yeah, 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 no, no, yeah, no, you start doing stuff you've never here. done in your life. You write these exactly. training articles that you've never yeah, yeah. done. Period. And it's obvious that you've never and done. That's it actually the big remote. problems with most online <laughs> training articles. Most uh, right. and uh, most articles you will see about training the big problem is that the programs given in the article has never been done by anybody it's just there to illustrate a concept or the coach add an idea oh that looks good on paper i'll write a program about it and get paid for it in reality yeah, I mean, yeah. personally I, I i will never write about a program i've never done or used with somebody because it, to me it would be intellectually dishonest because some things yeah. look great on paper but don't work in real life and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would, I, I can relate to that too. I mean, a lot of the articles I wrote would be things that were fairly common. It was just my touch on it. Like, okay, here's how I do five times five. And here's my experience with German volume training. And then people would often criticize me and say, Oh, you're just copying other people's stuff. Why don't you have some new things to write? And I was like, look, it's not, it's not like I'm, not, it's not like I'm ripping them off. I'm giving them, I'm telling you guys where I got this information from. I'm not saying that I came up with this program, but the reality is, is like, you know, this is my real life. I'm not going to just make something up for the sake of make something up just to differentiate myself. I think that most things that work great have already been done to some extent. Right. And I right. think right. it's right. how you use them that makes the big difference. And I think that we will – we will, that's also another thing, another reason why I uh, – to, to be an online coach, you have to be really gifted because I think that the devil's in the details because the program itself can work or not work depending on how it's applied. I mean, I think that technical cues are the most important thing. I was teaching a, a, a guy who wants to become a coach. And the one thing I told him is forget about advanced training methods. Forget about like creating the best training program. The first thing, the most important thing you can teach a client is how to perform each rep so that every repetition is as effective as possible. No coach teaches how to perform a rep properly. They might teach you some, like they give you some technical cues. They might talk about tempo. But what I'm talking about is making sure that every single rep is performed with a training style that will make sure that that rep is as effective as possible and never allowing a client to do an inefficient rep. And that th- I think that people are so eager to show that they know these more advanced training methods that they don't take the time to teach the most important thing. I mean, uh, you can do the best training program in the world. If every single rep is done inefficiently, you will get no result, really. That's right. Yeah, I mean, you're better off doing one great set than 10 sets of 10 where every set is Correct. sloppy. You're just bring yourself up. I mean, something like German volume training is fairly advanced. You have if you're going to do ten sets of ten with sixty percent of your one rep max on the squat, and you've only been squatting for a couple of weeks. That's going to get ugly real fast. Yeah, that's a big issue. Beginners who don't have uh, like solid automatized lifting form cannot do these super high either methods or sets because they won't be able to maintain proper technique throughout. So the risk of injury is great, but also they they will not load the proper muscles efficiently. Actually, like moderate or even lowish reps work better for beginners. I mean, if a beginner needs more volume, I would prefer to have him do more sets of low reps because with short rest intervals, because I know that the, the quality of each rep will be higher than if he does two sets of 15, for example. So yeah, but he can't do heavy weights right now because a, I'm not saying he has to lift big weights. I'm saying that if, if he has to do too many reps, he won't maintain proper technique and won't get good results from it. The motor learning will be bad. He will learn bad motor habits. He will not load the proper muscle and he will increase the risk of injuries. So really, it's I think, not I think Charles Paul, yeah, Charles has a great line where he only counts good reps. Exactly. So let's say you're doing the military press, and the first five reps are great, and then the sixth rep, you're back bending, your your teeth are grinding, and the bar is out of the it's out of the pocket, it's four feet in front of your face instead of straight overhead. You know, even if you complete that somehow, that wouldn't count. Yeah, yeah that, that, that comes from uh, that comes from Olympic weightlifting, in fact. 
Uh, if right. I'm not, uh, I think it was, uh, there was a coach in the U.S. And he came up with, the, the, he called it the Big 21 training program. Uh, you had to do 21, well, 20 perfect reps. And if you did your 20 perfect reps, you were allowed to do a 20 second one, which would, have, would, would be a PR. So for example, for the, you would do five reps with a weight, then five reps with another weight, then five reps with another weight, then the last five reps, you increase the weight every single rep. And if you did 20 perfect reps, you could attempt a PR on the 21st one. Uh, and that's one thing <laughs> that is problematic with uh, CrossFit, for example. They allow bad reps, uh, yeah. and that way you never learn technical efficiency. When you are under pressure to do that perfect rep, you can do it. The best yeah. example is that I used to play golf, so, and I was a great practice range golfer. I could hit some bombs on the practice range, but that's because I might miss 10 shots in a row, but it doesn't matter because I have a bucket <laughs> full of balls. But when I was right, right. Uh, like on the course, then I had to be successful from the first attempt, and the stress would take the best of me because I never yeah. learned to be perfect because I, I could allow myself to hit however bad shots I wanted because I have – a limitless amount of balls. That's the bad right. mindset. I think that training, yeah. even mm -hmm. if your goal is to build muscle or strength, it's all about motor learning. Learning to recruit the proper muscles. Learning to fire those muscles as hard as possible. Getting optimal muscle fiber recruitment. So you have to treat every single rep as if it were the only thing you can do today. So there is no place for a rep where you don't have 100% focus and where you don't apply yourself to do everything perfectly. Yeah. I think that's one thing that Pavel Sotsalin did a really good job of proliferating is not training the failure, mm -hmm. leaving a few reps in the bank, and then taking yeah. longer breaks in between sets so that you're not yeah. fatigued. You're focused on not just getting stronger, but you're focused on quality of repetitions. He did, he did a really good job. Not that he, he didn't create that message, but he did a really good job delineating, delineating it and getting it out there effectively. Yeah, that's one thing. Well, like coming it from is the a core of learning, uh, really. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, that's one thing I learned from coming from the kettlebell sport world. You know, one thing about the, the Russian, you know, all the guys who were masters of sport in that, you know, one thing about it, when you're doing a competition and that rep is not looking good and it's getting sloppy, they're quick to say no count. And that's just, yeah. those two words are like the words you hate when you're when yeah. you're training in kettlebell sport. Because and, and the thing is, even when I'm training with my clients and, and we're doing something I'm like no count, and they're like, damn. But it makes them yeah. really work on it. And, it. and it reminds me a lot of what Bruce Lee says. Like, you know, he he didn't fear. He feared not the man who had practiced 10,000 kicks once. But, you know, he fears the man who practiced one kick 10,000 times. Meaning, yeah. you know, you want to make sure that that one rep and that last rep, they look exactly alike. That's what you should no, be training. Exactly. And you look at elite you Olympic the match. weightlifters. You look at elite Olympic weightlifters, they can have 60 kilos on a barbell or 180, and it looks exactly the same. Uh, exactly, right. <laughs> the, the Russian female super heavy who was world champion, uh, the last time she was world champion, Kasharina, I think, the last time she was mm -hmm. world champion, for the three months leading up to the world championship, she did not miss one training lift. So, uh, of course, when she went to compete, she made, she made all six lifts because she never learned bad motor pattern. She never allowed herself to do a bad technical lift. Uh, and that is, I think, one of the best skills you can have in training, uh, whatever it's for strength or for size. I think that people who are training simply to, for muscle mass really underestimate the value of precise lifting. Precise lifting makes sure that the proper muscle, the one you are targeting, is receiving most of the tension. You know, right. The muscle receiving the most tension will grow the most. So if you allow yourself to shift tension to different muscle groups or to tendons, for example, uh, then you will not get maximum muscle growth. But people train with their ego, so they overuse their strong points and they never stimulate their weak points fully because they let the egos get in the way. No right. doubt. I think John, Coach John Davies made a really good point. He was at a, actually the first kettlebell certification I ever went to, Pavel's in 2002, and he saw me doing some double press. After I finished 
the set, which wasn't a pretty set. I could see, I, I knew that before I put the bells down. But anyway, he goes, you, you have way too much tension in your face. Like you, you got mm-hmm. like this angry look in your face. Yeah, like, but you he need comes to be from, calm. He comes from track and field. In yeah, sprinting, right. the one thing you learn is you have to run with a relaxed face. If you face right, tense right. up, it's the first sign that you're shifting tension in the wrong places. Look at the one. Well, I find meter. that it's effective with everything. Yeah. Yeah, of course. You should look yeah. like your your mind is well. No, not my, your mind is in there, but you, you, it's almost like you look like you're meditating. Your mind is right, 100% right, in exactly. your muscle, but it, the face is fully relaxed. I, I always say that whenever I'm lifting something, if someone is, not that I'm lifting it for other people's approval, but just using this analogy, if, if other people see me doing something, I want them to think that I made it look easy. You know, exactly. That's a sign that I did it well. Exactly. Even if it was a max repetition for me, I shouldn't be snarling. I mean, there's a place where, like, Mark Phillippe made a good point. He goes, you know, there's the this, this shout or the scream that people do in a max effort. If you time it right, it's effective. He's like, but if you don't time it right, you just look stupid. <laughs> you know, you just, he's like, there's a, there's a point in the deadlift, right? Like I was maxing out on the deadlift last year and I pulled the bar to my knees and it went from the floor to my knees fairly quickly. And then it started slowing down. So I kind of made that, you know, that sound and I was able to blast all the way through it. And everyone in the gym stopped and looked because it was, I mean, I had my head on. So it was obviously a lot louder than it sounded to me. And I was thinking at that moment, I don't feel bad because I completed the lift. Now, imagine if I timed it wrong and I didn't complete the lift. I'm going to look and feel really dumb. A lot of people do it. They're screaming. Like, Sincere made this joke. He goes, they're screaming, and the bar hasn't even moved yet. You know? like, oh, my like, man. The bar moves in the first. Base or... But the, <laughs> yeah, 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 can yeah. you just think about what that does to your adrenals? And cortisol level, oh, yeah. getting no amped up no before a step, so getting slapped in the face, getting all worked up. You should never. I mean, it's the great Alexeyev that said you should never train on the nerve, and right, that's totally right. true. Because I've seen too many athletes burn themselves out in training because they would psych themselves up every single time they wouldn't do a maximum lift, and that really you know, psyching yourself up might increase strength by ten percent. But it, as you mentioned earlier, it comes at a cost. And if you do no that doubt. too often, no then you're going to crash, hormonally speaking, and you're going to crash down. It's like and I, I honestly, blame. once a year is enough for that. It shouldn't. It shouldn't be like every workout or even once a month. Like one time a year, you're going all out. Wait, you should take never your train on the nerve. Yeah, even you have three levels further. of activity. Pardon? Yeah. No, I was, yeah, I was about to say this whole adrenaline thing. Now, just with this whole adrenaline thing, I don't. I like listening to intense music when I work out, right? But I don't like listening to it on the drive to the gym because now no, it's no, no. getting me amped up and I'm burning all this adrenaline energy and I haven't even exactly. started my workout. So if I'm, if I'm driving there all amped up, by the time I get in, I notice I'm a little bit tired now and I haven't even started my workout. So I don't, I don't put in the intense music until I get to that set where I want to apply the intensity. During all the warm-up sets, you know, I'm not listening to uh, – you know, Sarah Brightman or something like that, you know, or, or Sarah, Sarah McLaughlin. I'm trying to, I don't know, Dido. I'm trying to think of someone like, I don't, I don't know, uh, Adele. You know? I'm not listening to that during my warm up. That stuff, that stuff is great post workout when you want to relax, but I'm not listening yeah. to that stuff during my warm up sets. But it's kind of like I go from rock to like death metal once I get to that heavy set, and then I go yeah. right back to rock for the rest of the workout. It's an example. Yeah. You no, know, exactly. People are too amped up for no reason, and that is a big issue. They really underestimate the strength that has on their adrenals. And I won't name names, but I know of several strongmen or powerlifters that actually take adrenaline shots before wow. maximum lift, and sometimes in wow. training. That's serious. Most, most of these people won't see 30. I can tell you that. Well, there's a guy, I mean, I don't, I don't think you're referring to this guy, but I'm going to refer to him just because this is common knowledge. But there's a guy named Andy Bolton who's a great deadlifter. I actually met Andy Bolton. And when I was giving a seminar in the U.K., he was training at the gym I give the seminars at. He yeah, actually I was had to have, uh, kidney failure. Uh, trying to get a, yeah, well, that's where I'm going is I was going to get a one-on-one session with him just to give me some techniques on my deadlift and mm-hmm. fortunately, unfortunately couldn't schedule it in while I was out there. But he's an example. People who took his course told me that now, this guy can deadlift, I think, close to 1,100 pounds, definitely 1,000. Yeah. Yeah. But when he does repetition work with, say, I don't know, 405, at 20, he has, he basically collapses, not because the weight is heavy for him, but because the cardiovascular 
health well, actually, is not that, that, there. Actually, that, that yeah. is not the case anymore because he lost like 100 kilos. He, he's like oh, okay. Well, this is a, yeah, this is a while ago when I said, yeah, yeah. I know, a long uh, time, like maybe five years ago. No, yeah, he, he had kidney failure. Uh, he, he's scheduled, scheduled for an operation soon. Uh, wow. Now he's actually doing more of a strongman stuff because um, um, I think you know Jack Lovett, right? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Jack's a great guy. Yeah, with him. That was at his place. And, and Jack uh, coaches him on the strongman lift. Uh, so now he's more into he's conditioning work, lighter work, uh, so more training that is heart friendly. Jack is a serious athlete. I mean, he's ridiculously strong. Yeah, I'm doing strong, his program actually at the moment. Powerful. Yeah, yeah, he's a great, great coach. Really good yeah. coach. I want to get him uh, on the I know, show. I, I'm actually do, I, I'm doing his program. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm training him right now. That's the, oh, you're doing his program. Only, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he's still a great coach. <laughs> he is a great coach. Yeah. Yeah. And a great no, that's person. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, very good person. We, we uh, taught yeah, up at his gym, actually, in Newcastle. He's got a nice facility yeah. up there. Yeah, it's very nice, very nice. Uh, but um, you know, he, he didn't train that much for a year because of a hand injury. But now he's getting back oh. to some pretty, uh, pretty serious strength level now. Uh, well, you strength. bring up an interesting point, though, about where is the line between being strong and powerful is healthy, and then it drops off where it's actually unhealthy and it's going to actually decrease I was having that conversation and, with I was having that conversation yeah. with my wife, and that you yeah. know at the Sport or any physical activity is great until you're pushing for that extra 5%. I mean, right, right. And it's not just for strength. It's for also bodybuilding. It's for football. It's for track and field. Any sport where you're trying to push for that extra 5 to 10%, then it becomes really unhealthy. So it really is a matter of right. you have to be honest with yourself. Do you have what yeah. it takes to be a world class? If the answer is yes, well, then ask yourself, is it worth maybe losing five or ten years of quality life to achieve my goal, or should I focus on just achieving a level that, that's very high, but that is manageable for my health? Uh, and if you don't have the gift to be world-class, I think you should train just to improve, of course, but to enjoy and enjoy a better quality of life. Some people are just too tough for their own good. You know, like someone yeah, like yeah. Mark Philippi, who's – Mark Philippi is one of my top three favorite strength coaches out there. I've learned a lot from him. He's yeah. extremely mentally tough. He was When he was a strongman competitor, he was doing some kind of squat exercise in the competition. It wasn't a barbell squat, but it was some kind of squat variation. But anyway, during the middle of the set, he tore a quad. So he yeah. just good morninged it to finish the rep rather than Great. stopping. You know, but I, but there's a price you pay for that. Like right now, he needs both knees replaced. He's got he needs shoulder shoulder surgeries, and he's probably going to need a hip replaced. You know, that there's a price you pay with competing well, at no that level. There's no old strongman, right? Or very few. That's of them. right. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah. You wonder about powerlifters though, like someone like I don't know, like someone like Louis Simmons is 68. He does he can't compete yeah. now because he's had so many injuries. And in this recent interview with Joe Rogan, he talked about how he's perpetually in pain and stuff like that. And he seems. I mean, he said that his blood work is is healthy. You know, I haven't seen it, so I can't. I've never talked to him about it, so I can't confirm or deny any of that stuff. But you wonder what the longevity of of someone like him would be, who actually does apply things a lot smarter. You know, the West Side Protocol is very is very well laid out. It's a very effective protocol. But, well, but then you have to ask yourself. It, 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 I mean, is it, it, no? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say. I don't. First of all, most people. I think they don't understand the West Side system. That's you know, right. no doubt about it. When they think about the West Side system, the first thing that comes up to their mind is maximum effort, right? And sometimes right, it's right. dynamic effort or it's bands or stuff like that. that that's band not, works, yeah, exactly. Yeah, to me, that's not West Side. Yeah. West Side is you know, 80% of their tra- training volume is on assistance work. Really, the right, amount right. of maximum effort work they do is minimal. The number of maximum lift they have in a week is four to eight. That's less than 1% of their weekly volume. Uh, even right. their dynamic effort method, it's only about 5 to 10% of their weekly volume. So really, the main, the main thing of Westside is the assistance work. To me, what defines yeah. Westside is the capacity to target a weak point and fix it. That's what Westside do. 
And that's why right. people who try to do West Side, they don't get the same results. I think that, you know, I was at the Dave Tate's compound. Of course, it's not West Side, but it's a, it was a West Side-ish approach. And uh, yeah, sure. when I was there, I mean, I, I bench press uh, 445, and I, I wondered if I had to go bench with the girls. Uh, because my <laughs> yeah. bench press yeah. 600, 700, 800, uh, three people yeah. squatting over a thousand pounds in the same workout, a crazy weight. Yeah. But, but yeah. more importantly, you had maybe 20 lifters there. And these 20 lifters were all the world class, world elite. So basically you had 20 coaches. So they would, every single set you would do, you would have like seven guys who were training on the same squat rack as you, analyzing your technique and all that stuff. And once the main right. lift was done, they would say, well, you should be doing that assistant exercise and that one. So if you don't have yourself a great knowledge of what you need to solve a weakness, or you don't have a coach that tells you which exercise you should be doing, then West Side might not work for you because it will only work if you make the good choices for assistance exercises. If you make the bad choices, and oftentimes people do make the wrong choices because they like to, they, they will pick exercises they're good at which is the worst possible choice you can make. Pick the exercises you're the worst at because it's fixing your problem. Now, yeah. if people make the wrong choices of exercise, all they're doing is garbage volume because the right. volume they're doing will only increase cortisol level, but they don't get the strengthening effect of their weak point. And the West Side, people have to understand it's all about finding, diagnosing, and solving your weak points. The, yes, the max effort is important, but the max effort is really only there to teach you to use your muscles together in one main lift at a max effort. But the strength is built by fixing the weak links. And if you don't have the capacity to make the right decision when it comes to fixing weak links, the system will not work for you. It's not the max effort. It's not the dynamic effort that is a true solution. In fact, you could train without the dynamic effort or even without the max effort method, and you could still get super strong. But if you don't fix your weaknesses, then you won't be able to get as strong as you could. So that is the true secret of the West Side system. And it's the brain of Louis Simmons and his guys who are masters at evaluating what is your weakness that makes the system work. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, it's, 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 it's so important to have advice in general from qualified people. So yeah. even if you work at a gym where it's not as elite as West Side, if there's people there who are watching you squat, you, you can't see yourself while you're doing something. So in your mind, you might be thinking, oh, this feels great. I'm doing this perfectly. And then someone videotapes it and shows it to you right afterwards. You're like, oh, man, that looks like shit. That's happened yeah, to me a couple of times. Where I, 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 I filmed these. Right. I filmed these clips for YouTube, right? And the ones that make it on are the ones that I thought looked pretty good. But every once in a while, I filmed the one, and then I would go back and look at it. And I'm like, oh, man, that looks terrible. That's definitely Daniel, not going up, you know? When I was competing in Olympic in, weightlifting, I, my snatch was stuck at 125 kilos for about two years. And uh, hmm. at one point, I decided to film myself was old VHS tape and all that stuff. Uh, and I noticed that I was really not extending completely my back when I was pulling. I was really cutting my pull short. So in one session, I went from 125 to 140 just by changing mm. my technique. But if I had not right. filmed myself, I would never, not have known that I was making that mistake. So I think that... Yeah, I, I filmed least, myself one time... Yeah, I felt myself one time doing deadlifts, and I took it over to Mark Phillippe for him to take a look at. Like within one second of looking at it, he goes, "He goes, you're pulling. He goes, you're pulling way too slow off the ground. You're not. You need to dip and drive, and you need to be faster. He's like, you're just pulling with your back right now. He's like, this is like a back lift. There's no leg drive at all. So I went back to much lighter weights, and within a few weeks, it was a new PR, and it was much easier. It was like 20, 30 pounds more, but way easier than what I showed him that time. And so I mean, it's. It's, it's, it's. I mean, when you get at the, the keto, is you got to get the right advice. There's a lot of bad advice out there too. That's so the you, thing. If, and if, it's, you it's really, these, if you go to one of these Instagram experts that you're talking yeah. to, you're going to get bad advice. It's not going to improve anything. Well, and the thing is that you know, body types changes what is good advice for you. 
I mean, Absolutely. you are more posterior chain dominant than me. I'm more quad dominant. So, so what works right. for me will not work for you. But if I coach right. you as if you were me, I will give you the wrong solutions. So that's what that's I'm saying. What most people Westside do too, barbell yeah. will only work if you have the skill to pick the right exercise for one person. Well, that's a problematic mindset in pretty much every context you can think of, right? Like a lot of people will go, you know, I don't know why these overweight people eat all the time. You know, I don't think about food all the time. It's like, yeah, well, that's you, dipshit. You know, that's not them. You know, not everyone is you. You know, it's like, why are these people depressed? I never get depressed. It's like, yeah, they're not you. All right. Mm-hmm. There may be a lot of reasons in their life that are more mm-hmm. complex. What do you than know that? about them? You may not eat that much because you grew up poor and you didn't have that many meals. You have <laughs> the, the privilege of having five or six meals a day. You actually had one meal a day, and that was when you went to school and you had lunch. So, you, know, so you basically invented intermittent fasting. Exactly. You had no choice. Yeah. You know, it's like me. Yeah. When I was in college, I had no choice to be a vegan because I was broke. And so it was a lot easier to go to Taco Bell and eat bean burritos all the time. There you go. <laughs> actually, that, that's yeah, what like in. Uh, in, in Kenya, there was a joke because my my father, my parents lived in Kenya for a while. My dad's working for the UN, so he would have people over for dinner. And then, you know, my mother was a vegetarian. I am too, and so is my brother. So we're we're not eating meat. And these people would look at us and go, "Why aren't you guys eating meat? You got money." And like, oh, you know, we give them whatever the reason is, and they'd be like, "Yeah, you know, there's a lot of people that are vegetarian in Kenya, but not by choice. <laughs> you know, they, <laughs> right. they can't afford anything. They can't afford anything but that maize meal once a day or or whatever's around." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, hey, man, we've had you on for a long time. I just, wanted, I just wanted to get your opinion real quick on two things, and then I'm sure you want to get back to your day. Just what you think about these scales that send this charge through you as a way to measure body fat. A lot of the people have these, I don't know what they're called, Tanita scales or something like that at uh, home. I know uh, it's a um, bioimpedance scale. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, it's Tanita, but it's, it's bioimpedance. Uh, well, uh, to be honest, especially for people who are in shape, it's about as precise as uh, putting on a blindfold and shooting darts at numbers on the wall to establish <laughs> what is your body fat percentage. That's pretty uh, precise. Yeah. It's pretty precise if you have all the right Very numbers accurate. on the wall. But uh, yeah. you know, I'd, um, I remember one day, I mean, the, the gym uh, I used to work at, they, they bought like the most expensive eye and bioimpedance scale you could find. It was like a thousand dollars, crazy stuff. I gave you a yeah. great printout, it's like telling you where you're storing your fat and all that stuff. Now I, I, I used it myself uh, in the morning and then I tried it in the evening. Uh, and in the morning I was like uh, like 14% body fat and in the evening I was 9% body fat. So I said, well, that was a pretty effective day. I did a great job, right? (laughs) The thing is that depending on, yes, supposedly there are some that are adapted for the more athletic body. I just don't buy it. Uh, Depending on the amount of muscle mass you have, depending on your mineral balance, depending on your water level, water. if you're dehydrated, if you are properly hydrated, value is changed. And if you are deficient in magnesium and you are dehydrated, then you will test a lot higher than you really are. If I'm well hydrated right. and I'm, I am plenty of magnesium and zinc, I will test lower because I'm more conductive. I have better conduction. Now, I, yeah, that was, that was my experience too. You have a couple of waters after the first test. It drops yeah. down several points just on that. No, anyway. exactly. I, I, I had a, a football player I was coaching. The guy was like super lean, like vein on his abs and all that stuff. So pretty lean at uh, under 10%. Uh, they, they tested the whole team after a practice. He called me almost crying, saying it was 22% body fat. And that's a guy who had vein on his abs. So, well, yeah. <laughs> and you really believe that you are 22% body fat? Well, the scale said so. Fuck the scale. You have veins right. on your abs. Well, sometimes, sometimes even, if, yeah, even if that were an accurate measurement, who cares if you look good and you like the way you look, right? I get that yeah, with exactly. the hormone testing where people will send me over their hormone tests and they'll be really disappointed, like, oh, you know, my testosterone is only 550. I thought it was going to be 890, given how great I feel. I was like, if you feel great, then who cares what the number is? Yeah, yeah. No, everyone's no, number is going to be Vince different. Geronda right? said, Vince Geronda said, uh, if you don't like the way you look, what does it matter what the scale says? Yeah, right, right, mm-hmm. right, right. 
was the same thing. And also, mm-hmm. I mean, at least, no, if the measure was uh, like rep- repetitive, for example, I- I- even if the, 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 the scale was off by 5%, if it was always off by the same 5%, it would still work. But the fact of the right, matter right. is, it will fluctuate depending on how much water you have, uh, mineral balance, uh, if the muscles are fully loaded with glycogen, if they are depleted. There are so many variables coming into play. It's, it, it's, right. it's really basically, it's even more worthless than just guessing. Yeah, right, right. It's going to confuse you, if anything else. It can be... Yeah. It's just not giving, exactly. like you said. It's not. It's not. If it were just, if it were off the same exact five percent every single time, that's fine. You take that into the factor, and then you can still. It's still effective marker to utilize progress or to determine progress. But because it's fluctuating so much, it's basically worthless. Yeah, it's kind of like think. looking. It's not kind of like getting on the scale throughout the day. Rather, you get on the scale in the morning, then you get on before you go to sleep. You get on in the afternoon. It's fluctuating all the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the thing is that, for example, if you measure yourself, let's say every Monday. And if the scale is not reliable, then it can induce you into believing that what you did the preceding week was good. And you right. you might have actually gained two pounds of fat, but you don't know it. So you think, oh, I gained two pounds of muscle. I must be doing something right. And you just keep on doing it. On the other hand, sometimes, for example, let's say you're a bodybuilder preparing for a contest. And you step on a scale. The scale says that you are 6%. Oh, I'm contest shape. So subconsciously, you might actually ease up on your diet. I mean, when you have some cravings, you might like be a little less disciplined because, oh, I'm 6%, I'm fine. In reality, it might be 10%. Right. Uh, or on the other yeah. hand, it could yeah. give you a, like a measure that's super high. Let's say that you are really like 9%, and it gives you a measure of 18. It can just kill your motivation completely. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Even if it real life, it doesn't matter because if you like what you see, then it's still the same body, but it still plays trick with your mind. Yeah, the mirror, the mirror test can be deceptive mm-hmm. too because that's all on the eyes of the beholder, right? Someone you may look in the mirror and think you look terrible, and everyone else sees a really lean, yeah. ripped person. Exactly. And it could even it could even be a light, just the lighting. You know, for example, yeah, yeah, I mean, no, uh, if you look no, at no, yourself, no. Uh, if, and I know because I travel a lot, and no two hotel rooms have exactly the same lighting. So I might look great on yeah. one hotel and look bad in one other. <laughs> uh, that's why when yeah, I no, see no. all these people posting like pictures on Instagram. Uh, I still train <laughs> some like figure competitors, and sometimes they freak out. Oh, I see that girl; she's competing against me, and she looks amazing. Well, wait. That's because she's thinking the W. Mirror. That's why. <laughs> they got better mirrors. No, exactly. It's yeah, yeah, basically yeah. just better lighting. Uh, they maybe use some filter. Uh, they, they might take like ten thousand <laughs> pictures, and they take the one that comes out great. So it doesn't tell anything. So that that, that, that lighting is amazing, man. I've I've been in I've been in hotels where that, like it's so bright you don't look like you've yeah. ever worked out. And then I've been exactly. in other hotels where it's, it's, it's perfect. It's the perfect blend of light and darkness where like everything is popping. I was like, man, this mirror is great. I'm going to get this out. It's often in, it's often in, 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 it's often in London because the, the, yeah, yeah, for yeah, some right. reason, lighting in London hotels is very damp. It's it's very dark. Yes. So we have all these That's shadows. Right. Asia is also pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> And so, some of the gyms out there are like that too. You, you walk into the gym, you're like, "Wow, I didn't realize I looked this good." It's like yeah, it's yeah, a big difference exactly. than last week at home. <laughs> yeah, some of some of the gyms, they, they, well, some of these gyms have mirrors that are slimming. You ever notice that where you look taller? Yeah. Like <laughs> like some gyms, you're like, "Wow, my corner's so big." Well, yeah, it's like there's that. never it's one like mirror where I look taller. I mean, it doesn't exist. But uh, somehow I actually look taller. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, of course, it, it, I think it's, it's just like in some gyms, like the scale. I mean, you can always know what type of gyms you, gyms you are at when you look at the scale. In right. gyms that cater to the general population, the scale would be like two pounds lighter. And what, uh, hardcore gyms with big bodybuilders, it would be two pounds higher. Like uh, the people like to feel heavier or they like to feel lighter. <laughs> so, so it's 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 a completely different world. And it, it doesn't take much to affect your perception of yourself. No, that's right. No. That's why I always no. tell people that training performance is, is, a, is a much healthier gauge yeah, of, tra- of your progress, right? 
Plus, it's also self-motivating. At least it is for me, where if I'm improving, it doesn't have to be more weight. You're just improving your techniques, getting better. Maybe yeah. something that used to that, is, that used to feel heavy now feels light. Maybe you're getting a few more reps than you did on something then before. I mean, those are all self. Those are all the things that are to me are self in, intrinsically motivating. And, and once you have progress, you want to keep that progress going. And, and anyway, if you get that, like. Every week, every week for years and years and years, you will look better. But the thing is that right. changing body composition, you almost don't see it happening because it's so slow. But, but strength, as you mentioned, also ease of, uh, with which you're lifting a weight, that is like easy to measure and easy to see. And if you try to repeat that as frequently as possible over the long run, you can't help but gain a lot more muscle. Uh, it's obvious because if the body is performing, for example, in, in a year and a half, you are performing to, at a 30% higher level, of course you're going to have more muscle than when you started out. Even if you're not training for pure muscle mass, you will still have a better body just because performance will have, uh, like form will follow function. Yeah, I mean, there's a strength coach a friend of ours, Sabina Scala in, in the UK. She measures bar speed with a lot of her clients. Yeah, I use that myself. So that if the I bar speed, the... yeah, if the bar speed improves, yeah. then she's yeah. like, okay, that's an indicator of progress. Even though they're not necessarily lifting more weight, they're lifting the same amount of weight yeah, exactly. more efficiently. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. use the, I mean, the I, sensor I think... called uh, called the Beast sensor. That's the one oh, I'm okay. using. Yeah, and that. actually, you can also yeah. use it uh, to select training volume. For example, let's mm. say that you work up to a heavy double. Then you can, you're gonna do like you're gonna back off and do several work sets. Then you allow yourself, for example, uh, a certain like five percent decrease in performance. Then you stop your set. If you reach a five percent uh-huh. decrease in performance, you stop. So you're always doing the proper amount of work on that day. I also use it for when doing plyometrics jumps because if there's one thing that's hard to gauge its jumping height. I personally believe when you're doing jumps, you should not do jumps to the point where you have a decrease in speed. But really, it's it's almost impossible to have the proper perception of how much speed you're producing when you're jumping. So with that right. device, you attach it to your waist, you know exactly how much power you're producing. So you know when to stop. And with, and with box jumps, with box jumps, you don't like doing the the negative portion, if you will, where you're jumping at the bottom. Exactly, box, exactly. You, know, right? you I always want to jump to the, the top and then you step down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Correct. Correct. Is that just to avoid injury or what's what's the reason uh, behind me, that? To me, the, 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 the purpose of the box, well, I, I don't like box jumps in the CrossFit sense where the goal is just to accumulate work because basically right, what right, they're right. doing is they're learning to jump just high enough to reach the box, oftentimes they actually compensate by uh, flexing at the hips more when they're landing so they don't have to produce as much upward momentum. Uh, uh, okay. Me, when I train the jump, it's to increase power production. So I want every single jump to be a maximum effort. Now, for me, the role of the box is simply that the landing is not as stressful as if I'm doing a regular vertical jump. If I'm doing a vertical jump and I'm jumping 38 inches, then I have a 38-inch downward accumulation of kinetic energy, and that puts a lot of stress on the joints. Whereas if I'm jumping on a 24-inch box, then I only have a 14-inch landing uh, accumulation of kinetic energy so it's twice or even three times less stressful on my joints so, so the movement has less negative impact on the body now you don't want to ruin that by jumping off of the box so that's why you, i recommend stepping off of the box the goal is working on jumping high now you don't want a box that the goal is not to jump on the highest box possible to me that's just stupid. I mean, when you see those videos yeah, of yeah. people jumping to a box that's eye level, that, that's more a feat of hip flexor strength and uh, glutes and hamstring mm-hmm. mobility uh, than actual jumping power. The box right. is only there right. to provide you for a, a shorter landing, so you have less stress upon the landing phase. Yeah. And you have a, I mean, it's a, it's a different context, but even with deadlifts, last time you were on, you talked about how you want to reset every rep rather than you pull the first one and then you're just banging out always, reps two always. through whatever look completely different. Rep one where you re, 
like people will dip and drive on the first rep and then they're just slamming the weights in using that but momentum that's why you, you, you have going. people on the deadlift their 5 rm is the same as their 1 rm doesn't make yeah, sense right. i mean that right. tells you that something's right. wrong right yeah absolutely well, hey, man, it's been great having you on, as always. Real pleasure. Is there anything you want to plug, anything you have coming up? Well, uh, I have my uh, my website that will be coming up shortly, uh, tibarmi.com. Uh, we'll, uh, we have uh, over 50 video capsules filmed so far. It will be oh, lots great. of videos, uh, maybe some, uh, some articles also. Uh, and, of course, doing many, many seminars in the upcoming months. Uh, Australia, Poland, uh, the UK again, France. So it's it's pretty. It's going to be a pretty pretty busy 2017 for me. Are your courses mainly lectures, or is it? Are you going through exercises as well, techniques, uh, etc.? My strength is really more of the of the theory uh, portion. I do okay. some practical right. stuff, but normally right. what I like to do. No, it's either me who just give the theory, or I will pair up with more of a technical coach, uh, and right. he will give, for example, two hours on uh, bench press and squat technique, and I will take about I will t- uh, talk about uh, programming for strength, for example, how to correct weaknesses. Uh, I'm more comfortable uh, discussing. Uh, the the theory aspect. When it comes to practice, I, I work better one on one. I'm not the best at doing group coaching. That's not my strength. That's not my skill set. So when I when people want that, then I will pair up with experts in that area. Like for example, well, I mean the uh, problem the problem with group coaching and, and as someone who's done a lot of group coaching and seminars is that it's it ends up being very triage like, right? Because you can't give every single person in the room exactly what they need because there isn't Correct. time to do that so it, it, at best you're giving someone an overview of the concepts and then the goal of that individual should be to seek private instruction with someone in the right. locality or someone qualified to further what you learned in the group setting yeah, yeah. it works in my in my opinion it works uh, group group coaching works with either beginners who just need to learn the fundamentals, or very advanced athletes who just need that one little tip. Uh, right, but the, right, For example, right. uh, like last uh, two weeks ago, I was in St. Martin for a seminar, and uh, I gave the theory, and I had two members of my team, Kareem, who coached uh, the CrossFit skills, and Alex, who coached the powerlifting skills. Uh, so they did the, 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 the practical stuff. I did more of the theory. So I think that is the best thing. I mean, I, some coaches like to claim that they are the best at everything. Uh, to me, you should run away from these people. I mean, stick to what you are the best at. I mean, I, I'm a good practical coach, but I don't feel comfortable charging huge sums of money to be a practical coach because I, I think I'm the best or one of the best when it comes to theory and how right. to use the science of training. But if I stray away too much from that, then I just become just another coach. And I'd b- rather pair up with somebody who's an expert in that specific area to give the, 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 the clients what they're looking for. So, hey, man, um, I see you got your website. You got some courses coming up. No books or anything like that coming out, right? I will have the book with, uh, with Paul Carter. That's oh, that's right, with Paul Carter. On uh, November guy. 15th. Oh, okay, great. Okay. And that's going to be available on your website, Amazon? Uh, it's going to be on Amazon. 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 It's going to be, uh, I think we're going to have its own landing page on the, on the web. Okay, sounds good. Excellent. Well, hey, man, pleasure as always. Enjoy your trips. I never enjoy my trips. again at some point. <laughs> well, I, I don't either, which is why I don't either, which is why I stopped doing. No, I know. <laughs> I'm a after, creature after my last trip, well, last time I taught, I, I got so sick. Like the last day, I was overseas. So then I was super sick on the flight home, and I was sick for like a week mm-hmm. when I got home. I was like, all right, that's it, man. I'm taking this as a sign. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, but, uh, you know I do, yeah, no doubt, man. Well, I, well, well, the problem I had when I was always doing international travel is that I could never stay. On uh, consistent with my workouts, I would get on a roll and then I'd be overseas for a couple of weeks. By the time I got back, it'd be like 10, 15 percent decrease in performance. And then yeah, yeah. a couple of weeks, you're back to where you were before you left. And then it's time for right. another trip. And you're just you're just stuck. Even in that if spiral. you try to get your workouts in, it's just not the same. 
It never, it, everything, it never, I, I don't think I've ever had a good workout overseas. At best, you're yeah. just maintaining something. It's amazing how you got a workout in in Australia, how heavy everything felt. <laughs> you yeah. know, that's, that's always my feeling. That's why, I, as I mentioned, I just focus on diet. Uh, if yeah, yeah, at yeah. least I'm not getting go. fatter and I'm still healthy, I don't care if I right. lose a few percent of strength, I will regain it back. But if I get, yeah, get right. fat on that's top right. of that, that's the worst. You kind of want to just do something working out so you just don't fall out of the pocket, right? So that you're not exactly. just totally because out of whack. Uh, but it's more psychological than anything. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. I think, though, that if if I were to start teaching some stuff, I would want to do more more of the lecturing-type format than practical yeah. myself. So that, that would be something I think I could do a lot more of without burning out. Oh, yeah, I mean, teaching, doing hands-on group coaching takes so much out of you. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm more burned out for giving half the, the, the time. When I split the, 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 the seminar in two, when I, I do like half of the technical coaching, I'm more fatigued than if I do twice the amount of theory teaching. Yeah, because there's so many yeah, dynamics involved well, with all the people there, and you're, you're, you're constantly yeah. just having to stay alert so much and, and cater to everyone's response right. and making sure that every person is kind of getting you. You're scanning the room, and you're kind of looking at these eyes and like, okay, I'm losing that guy. And I'm yeah, because you always guy. have one or two who just don't get it. Yeah. Motor so, morons are everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're constantly demonstrating stuff as well, and then then you're then you're dentist, then you're walking around the room, and you're also demonstrating stuff over and over again, trying to get to someone. The problem also is that when you have so many different skill levels at a course, you have let's say five or six people that are learning really fast, so you don't have to spend that much time with them. But then they're disappointed that you didn't spend that much time with them. Correct. They're like, man, I spent all this money. I came out here. I only had like maybe two minutes. You kept working with that one guy over there who needed more attention. That's why I found that having assistants helped a lot. So when I had assistants, yeah. I would basically assign them to certain areas. I'd be like, okay, look, these three people over here are much slower, so I want you three to work with them. I'm not even going to come over there. And then, you know, the people that – that way I could spend more time with other people where everyone felt that they were getting the right amount of attention. It's it's tough, though, man, especially when you have 20, 30 people. Like in a, at a kettlebell course, we have 20, 30 people, and everyone's swinging bells at the same time. And like Sincere said, you're just scanning the room looking for – Quick tips. You get to the point, though, where you know what to say to someone quickly. It's like, okay, here's what you need to work on. Boom. Now, you you, you need to work on this. Boom. You need to work on this. Next step, you work on this. So, I mean, you, you get better with it as you go along, but it's it's extremely fatiguing. And also, just standing up for six to eight hours. I noticed that my yeah, back would always right. be really stiff, oh, yeah. right? I mean, man, it was so stiff after six, just, just standing up the whole time. I also found that doing intermittent fasting would always work well for teaching courses. I never wanted to. Yeah, I'd rather have a very light breakfast or nothing. I never, yeah. I yeah, never yeah, eat yeah, exactly. when I give a seminar. I never yeah, eat when yeah, I give a seminar. Kind of keeps you sharp, keeps you focused. Exactly. If you have a big lunch, you're going you're gonna to need to take a nap now. <laughs> I know, exactly. like, Hold on, folks. I'll be back in 30 minutes. <laughs> 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 no, it's tough, though, man. I, I, think, I think the best... I think the courses that I would enjoy most teaching at are, are ones where I team up with other people, where it's not just the Mike Mahler show, right? It's not just yeah. me for eight hours for two days, yeah. where the all eyes that, are on me. That's what the whole I prefer. Time. The, the only bad thing with that is that very few gyms can actually afford that. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, problem. It's much more expensive. To put it on. Correct. Yeah, well, because yeah. for now, example. If you have to pay the traveling fee for boat coaches. Uh, you have to yeah, pay exactly. uh, the fee of boat coaches. So it, it can well, ideally you work work. With people. Ideally, you work with people there, right? So if I'm teaching in London, yeah. I'm going to work with coaches in London. I'm not going to fly three other guys from the U.S. to teach out yeah. there, too, yeah. especially if they're not bringing marketing power. In other words, they're not mm. like 30 people are going to sign up whether they're there or not. And there's no point in me flying them out to be at the course. Yeah, right. So that that's another factor, too. So like wherever you go, you just team up with people that are there. Like if you're going to teach in, in Jack Lovett's gym, you know, have Jack teach too. He's a great coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, that that's always been my experience because I've had the opposite of even in the U.S. You know, I've done I've done these big events where you're flying out a lot of people, and like you said, it, it adds up real fast. Mm -hmm. It ends up not. It's it's easier for you in the sense that you're not teaching as much, but if you're the promoter, now you have to manage the whole wheel, which could, which is yeah, a headache exactly. in and of itself. Yeah, Sydney I found was one of my favorite courses ever. And I'm a beautiful city. The people who came out were awesome. Great students, great energy, very enthusiastic. And it was a big group. So that was just like a, one of those courses where everything went right. Like I felt great. Yeah. My strength was good. You know, my, my perform. not every course I've ever taught 
if I felt my delivery was all that great, but that one in particular, I felt my delivery was really good. Like everything was just firing perfectly. <laughs> it's like one of those courses where you're like, man, if every course were like this, I'd always want to do it. Then you have those courses where How nothing's firing properly. <laughs> 14, hours 14, 14 hours from Los Angeles. 14 hours from Los Angeles. That's not bad. How much was it? I, yeah, I went from LA, Las Vegas to LA, LA direct to Sydney. And I, I did Economy Plus, which is not not twice as much, but it's about a thousand dollars more total. Okay. But in my opinion, it's worth it because I'm, I'm not going to do a 14 hour flight in coach. That's that's just not going to happen. I've done it once when I went to Singapore. But the yeah, good thing is that I was next to Asian dudes that don't take up much room. <laughs> <laughs> the one good thing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I never have that kind of luck in coach, unfortunately. So I'm <laughs> when I came back from St. Martin, we had uh, I had like this the guy who like pretended to be like Oklahoma State linebacker or something. When it was he was a big fat guy. Yeah, exactly. He was a big fat. You, you ever you ever see these big fat guys who walk around like they're workout guys? It's like who are you kidding? No, no, that was that's exactly like, put the your, kind put of your guy. chest down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like he was walking exactly. like like. Barrel chested and then the uh, like uh, uh, perpetual nat syndrome and all that stuff. And he had yeah, the yeah, shortest yeah, yeah, yeah. arm, like T Rex's <laughs> arm, and they were not moving when he was walking. <laughs> and uh, it's funny because I, I spotted him like an hour before the, we boarded the plane. And I, for some reason, I said, I'm going to be next oh, to no. that guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the worst. what happened. <laughs> See, that's why I like Economy Plus, because even if you're stuck to a guy like that, you're still in a big seat on your own. And yeah, I actually right. lucked out to Sydney. I was in Economy Plus in the first row, so there's no one in front of me. I've got all the leg room in the world. I could get there and stretch out if I wanted to, which I did. And the lady next to me was very nice. So, I mean, that was actually a really good flight. On the way back, I was in Economy Plus. The seat wasn't as good, but it was it was still good enough. But you know what? 14 hours sucks no matter what. You could be in first yeah. class. It's still going <laughs> right. to suck. It's a long time to be in. It's a long time to be on a plane, man. You start. What? The worst part is when you're you ten hours movies, in. And, <laughs> well, I mean, you're ten hours in, and then you look at the the countdown, and you still have four plus hours yeah. to go. The part where you start. Yeah, you're still out. flying over water when you look at that little map. You're like, God, we're yeah. still over yeah. water. It's taking so long. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. After ten hours, exactly. you don't want to watch another movie. No, no, you're over. Ten it. hours, I found, is my. You know, I did the ten from Vegas to London is ten hours direct, right? I did that flight so many times, it, it didn't even phase me anymore. After a while, it didn't even feel that long. I could do that easily, but that, but that extra four hours to Australia, phew, man, that was brutal. But it was very lucrative too. That was one of my most lucrative trips. I was out there for about ten days, two weekends worth of courses. You know, and it was it was very lucrative. And oddly enough, I didn't have much jet lag when I got there. I mean, I felt great within. Really? 24 hours of being there. Yeah, I thought jet lag was going to be... But I'll be honest there. with you. I, I, I don't remember having been hit by the jet lag maybe one time. But uh, I, it never seems to hit me. I think that it's because I'm skilled at sleeping whenever I want. Yeah, right. that's that's very yeah, cool. Yeah. I'm not that skilled at that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't sleep well on planes. I don't you, sleep you know well on planes at all. You know what's I a do. big problem? <laughs> you know what's the big problem with traveling often? Is that now I've seen every single movie there is available on the plane. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, you can watch a series of now. a show. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you can watch a whole series of some show you've never seen. You'll see every episode. Yeah, but they have season, well, but on the plane they have like season one, episode six. Then episode yeah, yeah, that's right. Ten. They don't have the whole season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. On airlines now just provide Netflix and then they'll help everybody out. So therefore, yeah, there's a exactly. lot of shows I can catch up on now. <laughs> you know, with that, for those long. So the, the real, the real problem with traveling so much for work is that you have a negative connection to traveling. Period. Like for me, a vacation is not traveling at all. <laughs> no, so it's, it's hard to get out of that because I associate traveling with all of those business trips I've done all over the world over the years. Uh, last, last last podcast I I did, they asked me. Well, where would you go on a vacation? I said home. I, I would say home. <laughs> exactly. I don't want yeah, to like my balcony. <laughs> yeah, to, to the third floor of my balcony. That's I'm not where even I would going go. to the balcony, no, man. I'm just staying. <laughs> I'm just staying in the living room. <laughs> someone may rec- someone door. may recognize you out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to grow a beard, man. Yeah. <laughs> someone may see you on your on your balcony and be like, "Is that Vin Diesel out there?" <laughs> Paparazzi. <laughs> <shirt there. laughs> oh, not in Quebec, though. <laughs> That would be yeah, 
Well, uh, although he, they, they filmed the Chronicle of Riddick uh, in Montreal, they actually asked me oh, to be a okay. body double. Yeah. Really? Uh, well, yeah, but I was in Colorado at the time, so I couldn't do it. Oh, that's funny. Mm. That's funny. People would be like, man, Vin Diesel looks like he's in great shape for this role. Yeah, he finally, <laughs> he finally started training again. <laughs> the, the, the worst thing is you, that uh, actually a, a, a friend of a friend got that job. And it paid fifty thousand dollars for basically doing nothing. Wow! Yes. Wow! Wow! That's no joke. <laughs> I would have come back no for joke. Colorado. <laughs> yeah. Was the truth. yeah, yeah. Whatever you were, was that a vacation or you were teaching or something like that? Uh, well, I was coach. I was uh, working at uh, Biotest headquarters. Yeah, I'd be like, sorry guys, can't make it. <laughs> you know, okay. got to match the price, man. Can you match this fifty grand? Yeah, yeah, okay, exactly. Gotta... <laughs> well, cool, man. Great talking to you. Thanks. Always a pleasure. And and we're actually, we want to do this again. And I always have like two weeks a month where I don't do anything, so we can always oh, okay. uh, get something going. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll make sure to stay within. We'll make sure to schedule in on, on times where you have where you have ample amount of time to to devote. So that sounds really good. Excellent. All right, man. You take care. You have a good one. Right, thanks for everything, guys. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye. That was Christian Thibodeau, another great episode with him. We'll definitely get him back again at some point. Always a wealth of information, so make sure to check out his website if you're going to be in any of those locations he mentioned. Get to one of his courses. And also, make sure you support us. Use that coupon code LLA. Go get 10% off everything you see at MikeMahler.com. You can also get to my website via AggressiveStrength.com. But use that coupon code LLA off supplements, ebooks, books, videos, everything basically that you see over there. And how about with you, man? Yeah. Yeah, same thing at NewWarriorTraining.com. Use that same coupon code, 10% off everything over there that you can purchase. And also, I know some people were asking about um, these other, you know, they saw the post for the premium episodes, and they're like, hey, I'm not getting that in, like, iTunes or anything like that. Yep, you're not going to get it in iTunes or Stitcher because it's premium episodes. But you can be privy (laughs) to those episodes by heading over to Patreon.com slash LLA Podcast. Become a monthly supporter of the show, starting at 5 bucks, 10 bucks, 15 20 And we even got people that are giving us 25 a month because they really enjoy the content that we're putting out, especially in those premium episodes. So head over to patreon.com slash LLA podcast, become a monthly supporter of the show. And you also have access to those premium episodes. They're at least two a month. You know, there's some of these months where we actually have a five week month. So you might end up getting three of those premium episodes, but there's so much information in those episodes that, you know, it's going to probably take you a couple of weeks you know, to sit there and implement at least one of those things and start to see some of those things start to work. And sometimes it's going to be some of those episodes where we're just, we'll talk about anything. You know, it's probably going to take you a couple of weeks just to process the fact that like, wow, did they actually say that? I can't believe they actually said that. <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, we said that. <laughs> so, yeah, so head over there now, man, and go to Patreon, become a monthly supporter of the show. So when people say, hey, man, I support the show and I bought one of your products, like, no, you supported our business. That was that was great. We appreciate that. You know, but really support the show. That's where you head over to Patreon because that's what that's all about. That's to help really keep the right. show going and growing. So that's how you do that. And on top of all of that, whether you're you're subscribing to Patreon or you're buying a product directly from my site, the one thing you can also do is to share these episodes on social media and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher for those who are still over there listening and via those mediums over there. So there you go, folks. So there's so many ways you can support the show or our businesses. And there you go. Put them to use. All right. Yeah. Listen to it. Share it. Listen to it. Share it. Support our websites. (laughs) Get on the premium. It's a little list of activities for you guys to do this week. All right, folks. That's going to wrap it up for this week. We'll catch you on the next one. Take care. Take care, everyone. Bye.